Hello, everybody, and welcome to Weekly Manga Recap. It is March the 8th of 2017, and uh, we've got a pretty big series that we're going to be talking about, one that uh, we might actually be uh, adding to the recap. I think it's probably at this point. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's a 90% probably. Um, and, um, yeah. Uh, I don't know. Do we have? Do we? Do we want to get any tangents out of the way before we get in on this? I, I just have a real quick one here. So normally, if mm -hmm. you're if you're in the chat room before the show starts, when I come on, I'll play music. Usually, like right before I'll start talking. Usually, it's just what I play while I'm kind of finishing setting up things. And usually, when there's like a suggestion, I'll play like the themes from. If there was an anime adaptation to it, I'll play like the themes for it. But I I, I played an extra song this week, which was a. Uh, Carly Rae Jepsen DMX mashup. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Which is as ludicrous as it sounds. And it was there was no response to the chat. Every time I play a song that I like that they don't like, I get nothing but shitty comments about like, oh, Chris's taste sucks. Oh, All Star, you blow. Don't go, don't go chasing waterfalls. <laughs> they're what the just, hell. <laughs> they're just like, oh, you know, fucking jump off a cliff, you dickhead. I'm like, come on, like those are <laughs> solid songs. I play a fucking Carly Rae Jepsen DMX mashup as a joke. Nothing. Everyone was just carrying on about their day. It's. What's this? Eh, not noteworthy at all. I'm like, this, yeah, it, it, it's, it's as though nothing changed in their day. They're just like, oh, is it seven o'clock already? My Carly Rae Jepsen DMX <laughs> fucking mashup started playing. That's what I set my alarm to, man. I mean, I'll give it to you. It's a decent song, but it's it's certainly worth a comment if you've not heard it before. I'm not saying it's not a bad song. I'm saying it's an oddity that if you are going to comment on something, this would be the one. I also have a very short uh, story. Um, it's like not really interesting. It's just more. It's just an observation on how much of a slob I am. Oh, okay. Uh, so uh, I had to take an exam yesterday, and uh, I wanted to wear what I proclaimed to be my exam-taking T-shirt uh, for the semester. It, it's got the angel of death on it, and so you know I don't take exams. I slaughter them and harvest their souls. Uh, I did really well on the test. I got like a 96. So, awesome. um, so it worked. See, uh, but, uh, like the night before I was, I had like just done laundry, uh, recently. And so I was like searching through my shirts and I was like, is this it? No, is this it? No, is this it? No. And then I realized I couldn't find it because I just done laundry. So all my shirts were like inside out and upside down and stuff. And I've got like 10 black t-shirts. <laughs> and I was like, Jesus Christ, like every shirt that I wear is either black or dark, dark navy blue, except for like one. So <laughs> I was like, you're wearing a black t-shirt right now. <laughs> exactly. Well, this one is a little easier to distinguish because it's got a little bit of like white going around the back. So this one is the one that stands out the most. Yeah. And you can't even tell. I just I like I'm the idea of my black t-shirts because I've got no fashion sense whatsoever. I like the idea of you running through your laundry. Like, is this my Angel of Death t-shirt? No, this is my skull t-shirt. Is this my yeah. Angel of Death t-shirt? No, this is my like, skull teeth like t-shirt. I've got like five or six t-shirts that have skulls on them. <laughs> You're like, oh, I'm this so isn't the Angel of Death. This is just the head of the Angel of Death. <laughs> oh, pretty much. <laughs> Toss it aside. So, I mean, it, it, the thing is, like, I don't, I'm not like, self-conscious about my appearance because first of all i'm vain as fuck i think i'm a i'm a handsome motherfucker i've got a massive goddamn ego but i don't put any effort into how i care for myself at the same time so, <laughs> i just got nothing but t-shirts blue jeans and i don't bother to like do anything with my hair so oh god it, it was just kind of a sign like hey maybe you should wear something different nah i'm comfortable with what i wear <laughs> you're, like, you're like who are you to question me nicholas freeman the y ruler of time like this is your brain this is your better sense of judgment <laughs> you're like you will speak when spoken to money could be exchanged for goods and services <laughs> <laughs> you're like very good <laughs> enough <laughs> enough of the back <laughs> sass <laughs> Oh, God. So, anyway, there is no possible way I can go from that into talking about medieval shonen action Nick. Uh, with, a, with a pig story. So, 
Yeah, I was going to say, Nick, you of course suffer from one of the greatest sins of all, the deadly sin of pride. Mm. And I am a, a little bit of sloth. Person. A little bit of sloth, too. Quite a bit of sloth, actually. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, actually going through it, yeah, all of them line up pretty well. I'm a pretty <laughs> sinful motherfucker, I guess. I, 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 d going by the way that people have managed to piss me off in the past, I think pride is definitely one of them. I, I, I won't get into that now. Uh, seven Deadly Sins. This is a series that's been running for about four years now. Mm -hmm. uh, so not not it's a new-ish uh, series, especially for considering how popular uh, it has become. It's a very popular series. Uh, always is uh, charting very highly in the uh, manga volume sales uh, these days. And uh, it's not the first series uh, by this uh, author that we have covered because years ago we covered his previous series, Kanga Bancho, which I really like. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, this is uh, considerably different from that. That was uh, almost as much parody as it was straight-up action. Uh, this one is a bit more serious. Yeah. Uh, it's still very much like, you know, a lot of comedic shonen moments and stuff, but it's straightforward shonen battle with a medieval fantasy setting. Um, and, uh, honestly, if I'm being straight up honest, it's, it's really just kind of like a very typical, but well done Shonen battle series. I think, uh, there are a couple of things, a couple of details here and there that I think make it uh, set apart from the crowd. But I think mostly it's just, eh, it's, it's battle, Shonen battle manga that's done well. Um, I think. Yeah, it's, it's not atypical, and I, we should also bring up that this was a series that we've discussed on the show before. Mm -hmm. For a long period of time, this uh, this was a series that I used to bring up in the recap, uh, but I dropped it for a multitude of reasons, one of which being that it it introduced power levels, which was something I was never a huge fan of. And, uh, you know, going through it again, I'm like, yeah, it has power levels, but I suppose at least it goes hard into power levels. It doesn't just dip its toes into it. It goes pretty drastically in the direction of like, we're going to rank and measure everybody. And you should really multiply your numbers to make an equatable force to fight this opponent. Otherwise, it's just not going to work. It really annoyed me when they introduced power levels into this into this manga, honestly, because they get through an entire arc without bringing them up. And then suddenly it's like power levels. God damn it. <laughs> yeah, it it's, it's abrupt that it, it, it comes into the story and it it dominates it then. Uh, mm -hmm. For the most part, everyone's talking about like his power level must now be sixty thousand. It's overwhelming. Yeah, it, it's it's ultimately the closest. It's, it really to is like Dragon a, Ball Z. It it almost exactly like a magical device equivalent of a scouter from Dragon Ball Z just pops up in the series, and <laughs> and everyone just starts referring to power levels as like the thing you know to to deal with the rest of the time. Everybody. Like, it, it, it's so much so that at the, at the chapter cliffhanger is just like, he has a combat challenge rating of 26,000 or something like that. You're just like, what am I reading? What is this? It's, it's very annoying when it happens because uh, it, it, it just kind of introduces this element that was incredibly unnecessary. I literally it was just kind of there it was just kind of dropped in in order to provide a very easy means of explaining this is how much stronger this person is than this which could have the series was doing just fine beforehand of showing that instead of just saying it hmm. um it's on it's honestly it's, it's weird that we bring it up this early before we've talked about any of the characters. You're like, who's a character in this? You're like, shut up! There are power levels so unnecessary. It, 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 but literally, like, you get through the first arc, and then literally one of the first things that happens is, and now you've got, and now I've got this earring so I can measure people's power levels, and let's spend an entire chapter explaining how power levels work. <laughs> yeah, it is so, a very abrupt change that the story like, line. jumps upon, but. Yeah, I, I guess the, the 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 plot of this that we should explain is that it's about a group known as the Seven Deadly Sins, and they all embody one of the different, you know, typical Seven Deadly Sins with their own unique powers and abilities and their own uh, dilemmas that they've dealt with in the past. And not just called the Sins because they're, you know, slightly roguish, 
they've all done something in the past for which they feel incredibly guilty about. They've all sinned, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And it's about their and their their sin is tied into uh, what their crime was or their accused crime was, because some of them didn't actually do anything. (laughs) Yeah. And ultimately what it is, is this this group kind of has to they, they split apart. They were formerly protectors of the king. Shit happened. They became outlaws. And now they're kind of banding together to stop this hidden corruption, these demonic mm-hmm. forces and things like that that are threatening to destroy the kingdom. Um, I forget the name of the kingdom itself. Is it Camelot? Or that, that's the foreign no, one. No, that's, that's, that's the one that Arthur comes from. Yeah, but what's I, the name you, of you, could, you might think that I'm just making a joke, but no, literally, Camelot yeah. is in this series and Arthur does come from it. <laughs> Arthur Pendragon. He doesn't do a lot either. <laughs> I was very surprised. I thought that because uh, like he shows up and you think he's just going to be this awesome badass because he is for like the first couple of chapters, and then you think, okay, well it's about Arthur. It's going there's going to be a side plot about Arthur's rise, and uh, like a lot of things in the series, it's uh, seems to get kind of forgotten about. <laughs> he's kind of just pushed off the side a little bit. Uh, Britannia is the name of the country. Uh, is it Leones? Because that's the name of the family. Of the royal family. Maybe it is just Leones. Whatever. Regardless, it's an anonymous, you know, English style kingdom. Mm-hmm. And uh, the main character is Melodius, and then our, our side character slash sexual abuse partner is uh, Elizabeth. Okay, this is going to be a little bit of a. <laughs> I know. I, I feel like I'm. This always... is going to be a bit of an odd thing to be talking about because Meliodas is. Meliodas is kind of an odd beast for a shonen protagonist because aside from maybe one trait of his, it's a little difficult to explain, you know, it's like, okay, what makes him like different from a a lot of other shonen protagonists? Not a whole lot, honestly. Uh, You know, he's really a lot of the stuff that you can talk about, talk about that are typical of shonen battle protagonists. he, He meets a lot of the check marks. Uh, it's really more like, what kind of shonen battle protagonist is he then? What kind of a character is he? As uh, he's the kind that's you know, uh, he's pretty calm and collected and happy-go-lucky most of the time. Uh, he gets along with people by fighting with them. Uh, he uh, is confident in himself no matter what. Uh, he forgives people easily. Uh, you know that kind of stuff, and uh, he has a hidden demonic side to him. Uh, you know, he's got this inner demon, which is actually just that he is a demon, yes. and secretly. Spoilers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the thing, the unique quality that he has is that he is an unabashed pervert. Um, and I like the way that it's explained at one point because essentially the. To, to get a little bit ahead of in, in the discussion, there's another character named King, or his title is King, but everyone just calls him King anyway, and it's a lot easier than calling him Harlequin. Um, <laughs> so I'm calling him King, too. Uh, King has a crush on uh, one of the other sins, Diane, and uh, he sees the way that Meliodas treats Elizabeth, who is the princess that is going around trying to find them all so that she can save her kingdom. And uh, Meliodas just, like, gropes her. Just all the time. Just kind of, like, you know, like goes over to her and is like, Yo, what's going on? <laughs> exactly. You know, acts, acts like it's no big deal the entire time while he was doing it. And she's kind of getting embarrassed sometimes, but usually doesn't really mind too much. Um, which honestly makes it funnier, I think. The fact that she's just like, okay, all right, we've well, got, got to go do this. Okay. <laughs> it starts off very, like, kind of weird, because she's definitely, like, coming to him from a place of, like, I need help. And mm-hmm. he's just like, hey, this oh, okay. looks like a nice help. skirt. All right, Flip well, up I'm going to ma- make you my aid in my, in my, in my <laughs> giant boar uh, bar. And I guess it's just the fact that it keeps happening that she just stops getting like bothered by it. like she's almost just like she's like doing the it's rest a, of her day it's like, an just, inver- like it's an inversion of the of the Lucy thing because Lucy's like you know all this stuff just keeps happening to her and she's still embarrassed every single time that it happens Elizabeth eventually she gets groped like the fifth time and she's just like I guess that's just the way he is okay <laughs> it, it's it's honestly the part of him that I always find tough to get over because it's very like uh 
it, it, it just seems very like unnecessary. <laughs> like it just a lot of people and in the chat are saying it's yes, it's part, very gross. like I said, it's the part of him that I think sets him apart the most. <laughs> <laughs> his, um, his rampant perversion. But anyway, to, to get back to the point where I was explaining, like, King has a crush on Diane. And he sees the way that Meliodas just gets to just grope Elizabeth all the time. And he's like, I really kind of wish sometimes that I could just, like, just do that. But he can't. He's too shy. You know, he's got, you know, and it's not that he's shy, but so much as, you know, he has morals. But, <laughs> you know, he gets too flustered and shy in order to actually do it. Like, he can't even express how he actually feels towards his crush and stuff. And so he goes to Meliodas and he's like, teach me your ways. And Meliodas is like, okay. So what we're gonna do? The girls are off taking a bath in the in the stream over there. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna go join them. We can do that. Yeah. See, the thing is, once you get in your head that you're doing something wrong, that's where it's over. So you have to just have it in your mind that nothing that I'm doing is wrong. You have to essentially be a sociopath. <laughs> oh, yeah, I was like, that is not a good reason. <laughs> so he just so literally he's like you know Miller just like takes his clothes off and he goes and takes a bath with the girls and they're like oh Meliodas ah. and so uh, King is like okay me too but he like is all flustered and blushing about it and he acts all creepy as a result because he thinks that what he's doing is like you know wrong so therefore he's they're like conscience. ew gross and they beat him up so That's... it's like oh that explains it in a nutshell it's just Meliodas just go, just acts like a pervert but he acts like nothing is wrong. And because of his overwhelming charisma, I guess, people just go with it. Except for Hawk. Hawk calls him out on it every time. It is also strange because this is the character archetype that usually has someone to, like, reel them in. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, Brock, when he hits on a chick, someone punches him and drags him away by his ear. Sanji, yes, he when he starts the, yeah. Sanji, when he starts doing it, usually somebody comes by to, like, knock him over the head and pull away. No one really does he that for Melodius. <laughs> he just kind of no gets to do it. <laughs> that that's the spin on the joke is that he just gets away with it i guess <laughs> um which it's it's going to be hard i think that a lot of <laughs> i think that a lot of your way to uh, interpret melius is going to be based around whether you think he's funny or creepy honestly <laughs> i really i had trouble seeing it like in another way but i, I would say that the thing that I, helps with this is that this is, I think, maybe the closest series I've seen to capturing that feeling of having a group of characters that are kind of like the Straw Hats in that yeah. it's a group of all characters who all feel very fleshed out and mm -hmm. distinct and have their own personalities and traits and things like that. It's not perfect. It's but, not perfect. It's not 100% of them. But it's, it's uh, but far it's the majority more so. of them, definitely. It's far more so than something like Fairy Tale, where it's like, yeah, there's really only like three or four main mm -hmm. characters or something like that. This one, it, like, as the group expands, they do give these characters focus. And even side characters, like, who aren't even part of the Seven Deadly Sins, get their own chance to, like, kind of mm -hmm. grow. And, and Gil Thunder. Like uh, Gil Thunder, at least at the beginning, is a, is a total badass. I love Gil Thunder. Uh, Elizabeth herself, um, she starts off pretty bland, but. She actually really benefits over the course of the series from a lot of character growth. Um, she was annoyingly passive at the beginning, but I think that she, especially towards the end of the first arc, starts to come into her own, and then she actually continues to develop beyond that point. Mm -hmm. um, and I so, think it's, it, it just helps that even if you, you don't like Melodius, if you don't like his his, his personality... You could still benefit from the fact that there's characters like Bon or King or Diane that you mm -hmm. could be like, I like this one at least, and I'm gonna dig mm -hmm. this character. So you have more to except for uh, except for Gouther. He can Gouther, go fuck Gouther could eat a bag of shit. Guy. Starts, I can't okay. stand okay. that guy. <laughs> okay, the whole thing about Gouther is that he is an emotionless doll given life, but apparently. <laughs> When you're given life and you don't have emotions, it just makes you an asshole for you're, no reason. <laughs> you just, you took all the personality out of it and you're like, just put cockhead into this. Just slam all this douchiness into one doll. Like, uh, towards Slutty the end of the Slutty douchiness. He, his thing is that he's given a really nice introduction, honestly. Because he's in disguise when he first shows up and he's like protecting and acting as the servant for this little boy. That it turns out he feels indebted to because of uh, something he and the boy's father did. And so he disguises himself and uh, joins the guy's group as a lackey and, uh, you know, 
looks out for him. And then when he has to go off with the seven deadly sins, he gives him, you know, a fond farewell. It's like, oh, okay, that's that that was nice. And then it turns out he's just kind of like fascinated by humanity and emotions and wants to fuck with people to learn more about them. Like he literally uh, takes a girl and erases her memories in order to make it make it so that he is the only important person in her life so that she'll worship the ground he stands on so that he can learn what love is. And he, and he, he so, does it. So he does that. And the then like, that, he, well, he does that. And he's like, yes, I did it to learn what love was. And she gets really pissed off when she, you know, when they, he's forced to, uh, re, you know, um, return her to normal. He's just kind of like, ah, I got dumped. He just doesn't care because no, he doesn't have emotions. It's all meaningless. Yeah. He'll, he'll do things solely because he's like, ah, I'd like, there's a point I where Diana I, I, says something where she's like, oh, well, my memories of King will, now that I had them back, are going to be something I'll treasure forever and can never be removed. Galather's whole thing is he has the ability to take memories away. So when she says that, he just takes the memories away to be like, they weren't any harder to take away than anything else. She was a they liar. Precious, <laughs> them, being, them being precious didn't make them easy, any harder to take away. So. And it starts like a whole fucking side arc to get her memories back. Just because Galther was... not It was like 70 chapters ago. Just because Galther felt like being a douche. And there's a whole thing where it's like he's one of the original he's like with this this like awful demonic entity it turns out and it's like it doesn't matter he's an asshole now <laughs> he still hasn't redeemed himself i still wouldn't want to be friends with him there's no point in this fucking evil doll's history where i'm like he seems like a fun companion he does nothing but fuck shit up he was fine when he first showed up like that was an interesting thing where he's like he he felt this kind of he had this kind of sense of indebtedness to this kid and so he looked out for him it's like oh that was nice and then it turns out he's actually a really big prick <laughs> i have no emotions therefore i'm just a complete asshole like i understand that that takes away his sense of empathy but <laughs> oh god but so like okay five of the seven deadly sins i like like, uh, I like Escanor. Uh, he's very simple, but I like uh, his his whole thing. I like how he turns into a giant muscular badass with a dapper mustache. Uh, Diane, I have mixed feelings on because um, I thought she was fine to start with. And then she just kind of got stereotypically girlier after the first arc. Um, King is great. Uh, love King. I... Uh, and I love Bon. Um, Meliodas is I, is all right. Merlin is like the Robin of the Seven Deadly Sins, though, where she's the blatantly I'm the sexual perfect one of the group, and it's just like, guy, you're not interesting. <laughs> I kind of like her, if only because she does fill a role in the group of somebody who kind of has their shit together by and large. I get that. I get that. That's nice. But she's fucking perfect. <laughs> well, I mean, they have. She is. I think what kind of works is that she's like the first of the seven deadly sins to kind of like really get jacked up when the Ten Commandments show up, and she doesn't. Like, and then just, it turns out, uh, yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> well, just doesn't turn out she's just fine. She just manages to find a way to still be with the group until they find a way to get rid of the curse, but. It, it, yeah, I mean, she doesn't have a whole lot going for her, considering that, like, you have Bond, who's this immortal, sneaky, sinister kind of guy, and King, who's this mm -hmm. almost oafish, goofy kind of character, and everyone else with their big personalities. Merlin doesn't have a tremendous amount to offer, personality-wise. I, I guess we haven't learned where she got her sin from yet. So no, not yet. So um, maybe when they actually reveal her backstory more, then maybe she'll get a bit more interesting. But for right now, it's just like, Wow, you're kind of perfect, and that's boring. <laughs> that's the way I see her. Uh, I, I feel like I'm I'm kind of trying to put the characters I don't like ahead of the characters that I do like when talking about them, because especially in the first arc, we get some backstory drop that's like that really makes you feel sympathy for some of these main characters. Um, I was uh, I think the first really major one is when we get Bond's story. Um, which explains where he got his immortality from. Almost all of the Seven Deadly Sins have some form of are broken immortality <laughs> or uh, extended life. The only one that hasn't been confirmed with is uh, is Escanor so far. 
like Escanor doesn't seem to have like anything revealed yet that makes him like actually have extended life. Uh-huh. Um, but Merlin's thing is like I just stop time <laughs> for myself. Melios has some curse. Uh, Diane and King are respectively a giant and a fairy, and so they just have long lives lifespans. Uh, but Bon, uh, his whole thing is tied into how he got his immortality. Uh, which is that he was this thief, which ties into he's the sin of greed, and he uh, went exploring one day trying to find the fountain of youth, basically. And he ended up going into this spring where it was guarded by a girl named Elaine, and the two of them ended up falling in love. And then Elaine was killed, and uh, the the spring with the you know could, could provide immortal eternal life was going to be destroyed. Uh, so she took what was left of it, and she, and she k- kissed Bon in order to put it to make him sw- swallow it. And so he has eternal life, and she died doing that. And so Bon's whole thing is that uh, he met the love of his life. She was taken from him, and he can never be with her because she's dead, and he's immortal. Mm-hmm. So, and it plays into it that she was one of the fairy people, or the the she was the queen of the forest, essentially. She was the guardian, I, guardian uh, of the forest. Right. And Which was because supposed of that, to be King's duty. Yes, and because of that, King, when he finds out the truth about that, grows to hate Bond because of it. Now, that's mm-hmm. something they kind of get to and eventually start dealing with in parts, but it's nice that they start to kind of intertwine some of these stories as well. Very early on, like, King's King's introduction is that he hates Bond. Uh, mm-hmm. Because he thinks the Bond is solely responsible for his sister's death, which he's partially responsible. But you know, the more that King learns about it, and they end up going to the land of the dead, so he can speak directly with her about it, which is convenient. But um, you know, it, it really complicates this relationship between them. It's it's it the way that the the first couple of sins are introduced is in the way that their backstory is intertwined. It's really nice because you know I have to remember that these guys had been a group uh, previous to the series. Like, 15 years before the series takes place, they had all been a group together and had worked together. And, uh, but things are kind of spiced up because they also kept secrets from each other, so they also learn stuff about each other uh, as time goes on. Um, do you have, like, a favorite sin? Um, I kind of like Diane a lot. I do see her issues with her where she does become a little bit more, um, I don't know what what the term I'd use for is, but I suppose what I always kind of like about her is her simplicity, where all the, the, (laughs) well, it it, it does help because this is a series where, and this is, you know, the same guy did Congo Boncho, which was a series Mm -hmm. about like, essentially like a one punch man, almost like a dude who just always beat people. And just and, knew the right way of doing things. <laughs> yeah, and this series kind of follows in that la- uh, that vein in that almost all the main characters are broken to shit. Melodius is just full counter. Reverse your attack against you. Reverse your attack against you. Reverse your attack. You basically can't hit him unless it's like a, a physical attack or something like mm-hmm. that. Only specific and ways. he's absurdly physically strong, yeah. too. So. And Bond has the ability to, like, snatch your heart out of your body and he's immortal so you can never really kill him. And yeah, Like, everybody has, like, this crazy shit. But Berlin Diane can stop time. Everything she does lasts forever. Yeah. Uh, es- Escanor, like, w- as the sun rises, uh, he gets stronger and stronger. So he's got a built-in weakness, but when it's noon, he's, like, the strongest thing in the entire world. Yeah. Uh, but with like, Diane... They're, 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 their second arc enemies are introduced, and they're like, oh my god, they're so much stronger than the Seven Deadly Sins, and Escanor beats two of them at once <laughs> in his introduction. So... <laughs> Uh, I mean, he's freaking badass and awesome. (laughs) Diane's simple. She's just a giant. She is very strong, and like certain giants that are in touch with nature have the ability to manipulate Earth, and it's a cool power. Like they, they, there is very cool action to the series, and I think they utilize that well with Diane. But because of that, like her power set's very easy to grasp, and I, I, I enjoy that her character's pretty simplistic too. Like you're able to get kind of easily behind it and it's one thing we haven't really talked about though you maybe i'll be able to pick up a little bit uh this series is one of the few that it does not shy away from pretty firmly putting characters into pairings and dealing with romance almost every significant character in this series is either in or was formerly in and the very significant romantic relationship with somebody else you it's know. uh it's it was something that was really refreshing 
especially, you know, getting towards the end of the first arc and seeing the way that the relationships between characters had changed, uh, not just over the course of it, but, you know, when you get to the finale of this first arc in the first 100 chapters, you can go through, it's like, uh, you know, Meliodas and Elizabeth are almost officially a couple at this mm-hmm. point. Their relationship has changed over the course of their journey together. Uh, King's crush on Diane is getting reciprocated because they had a past together, but King erased her memories of it because they traumatized her. And so she was remembering what he had made her forget, and now she understands how she feels towards him. Uh, Bond got his thing with Elaine and his journey to try and keep on uh, to resurrect her. Uh, there's the stuff that is teased between Gouther and uh, what's her name? Slater. Yeah. Not Slater. Slater is the well, creepy guy with the mask. Slater has something going Slater's on for Gouther. Slater's got crush on Gouther, which is kind of weird. <laughs> and uh, the explosion girl. Oh. Um... I know which, what you're talking about the girl with like the, the Brock eyes. Starts off perfectly fine. It starts off perfectly fine, but then it turns out he it was all a lie because he's an asshole. Yeah, I, I can't uh, remember her name right now. There's a night. There's a night. Uh, an, a weaker knight named Jericho who's got a crush on Bon. Uh, then there's like Elizabeth's sisters both have a knight who is their who is their bodyguard that there's really uh, romantic stuff going on between, especially uh, with uh, Gil Thunder and. Um, Margaret, I think is her name. Like the two of them just flat out have a scene where they're where they're getting ready to kiss uh, because Gil Thunder's getting ready to go on a journey and leave her. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, it turns out because Gil Thunder had been one of the primary villains in the first arc, pretty much just because Margaret's life was in danger and there was no way that he could protect her unless he went along with the way that the evil corruption uh, in the government uh, was going about stuff. Um, so all these different romantic pairings that change over the course of the first arc and then honestly do continue to change proceeding forward. That was one of the most refreshing parts of it was that not just that there are all these couples that were teased, but that were teased and then constantly built up in different ways. So, yeah, it's it's, it's refreshing. You you do get more romance this than you'd get in your typical series. And it's that I think is one of the things that to me helps kind of set this series apart. Um there's some issues with this series. We've already gone over a few of them. It also runs into the issue early on with me, wherein, and it, this becomes less significant as time goes on. They start actually introducing villains stronger than the heroes, but almost mm-hmm. every main villain that they come across early on, it's essentially um, the kingdom is sending out, you know, evil knights to try to stop them. They're all just humans who are given these, you know, elaborate powers and backstories and things like that. And every time you see it, you're like, these fucking clowns aren't going to beat them. Like, <laughs> they're never going to beat them. These guys are ridiculous. And every time it follows that same pattern, you know, they they, they seem as though they're going to be intimidating. They're going to be a challenge. And then, bolt, Melodius beats them in one attack or whatever. And you're like, all right, come on. You basically kind of have to get through the first saga before you start to mm-hmm. see characters that start challenging them. But then it's almost like a switch gets turned. And the villains are actually the ones now that are completely outclassing the heroes. And you start getting a twist that helps make things a little bit more exciting. And I think adds to some kind of some pretty decent fight scenes and things like that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, there are moments that are just outright vicious and brutal to look at. Um, it helps that, you know, it's almost like try on wars because essentially half the characters are immortal. You could just do brutal shit. Like uh, there's a scene where uh, Slater just shows up behind Galther and just like snaps his neck by like spinning it around. And you're like, holy shit. And you're like, all right, he's a doll. Who the fuck cares? I was like, oh, that's inconvenient. <laughs> but it's still cool because it's like, okay, all right, like this is decent. I can I can get behind this. Like, you know, you get those cool moments where you're like, oh, all right, that looks pretty awesome or things like that. And you, you get a, a big cast of characters to kind of work with too. There is uh, one of my favorite uh, little moments is in the most quickly interrupted tournament arc ever. <laughs> where, like they're paired off into like eight eight battles in a tournament ladder. You see like two and a half of them before it's <laughs> like, oh, we were doing the whole thing now. Well, which is cool because you get to see, you know, Elizabeth and Elaine actually in battle uh, for once. Uh, and they actually handle themselves really well. Um, but Bon and Meliodas are matched up against each other. And so they're like, okay, because, you know, these they, they get along by fighting with each other. So they've got no problem with going up against each other. 
And so they're, you know, teasing each other and throwing punches at each other. Meanwhile, their actual opponents are trying to attack them. One of them rips off Bond's arm by, after it flies by, and it and uh, Melius is like, huh, you lost a hand, and, and Bond's like, don't change the subject, and Zane grows back. One of them tries to attack Meliodas, but he's so ridiculously strong that his claw comes off on his head. Uh, and then they start throwing punches at each other, and the demons fly in the way of their punches. <laughs> and that's how they win. <laughs> It's it's pretty ridiculous. Plus, if you like that kind of like uh, Sanji Zoro kind of like fighting rivalry, you get a lot of that with Bond mm-hmm. and uh, Melodius because that's essentially half the time they interact with one another. I've um, got a really strong bond uh, between them, uh, and uh, there's a point where um, Bond is offered this you know deal with the devil, and uh, what they say is if you know you kill Meliodas, then we will bring Elaine back. And Bon basically goes and tries to do it. Uh, he eventually decides, I can't do this because he's my best friend. And what kind of person would I be if I killed my best friend, even if it was to get my lover back? Um, but they go at each other seriously for once. And it does feel very different from their act- from their usual playful confrontations, which are always cartoonishly over the top. Yeah. Um. There's a lot of good stuff uh, in it. Um, I think that my favorite sin is... I think it's King. Uh, so, you like Diane and I like King. Um, they were meant for each other, Nick. They're, 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 they've got an, an interesting relationship, and King's got a freaking ton of baggage on him. <laughs> this poor guy. Well, his you, best. You... He killed his best friend. Like three times. Three times. <laughs> <laughs> I, th- I remember talking about when going through it on the podcast and being like, "He's like the third time this dude's killed this guy. <laughs> Stop trusting him." <laughs> Poor King. <laughs> He's like the star scream of your family, and you keep trusting this dude. Well, now he carries around his soul in a helmet. <laughs> uh, he can't be with it with the girl that he loves because Diane keeps on forgetting that she loves him. Uh, <laughs> his sister's dead. His people hated him for a little while because they thought that he had abandoned them when really he just suffered amnesia. Uh, <laughs> his sister's dead. <laughs> this poor guy. No wonder he's like the most popular character in this series. He must have all the fangirls like crying over him. <laughs> Yeah, it's actually that he's was like, kind of surprising. Guy had done well, honestly. <laughs> he's this short, overpowered, cute as fuck kid with a lot of emotional baggage. <laughs> Except he turns into a flabby dickhead when he gets embarrassed. That is my least favorite part of him. <laughs> Why he thinks that's charming, I don't know. <laughs> like, I get he wanted to be in disguise, but it's like when he's flustered, like the disguise drops. When really, that's the disguise he puts on. It's like. You are an ugly little asshole when you take that form. Diane will never want to get with you if you take that form. <laughs> but I love him, though. He fights differently from everyone else uh, because he's got this javelin that takes, like, 50 different forms. It turned into a giant teddy bear golem thing half the time. Yeah, um, he, he fights essentially, like, with telekinesis, too. Like, he doesn't mm. actually... Because he's the sloth character, so he doesn't get involved in the fight. He'll just do his, like, fucking mind control floating nonsense over there. Which they make a point of uh, when they take a part... They take part in um, a village festival uh, hand-to-hand uh, combat tournament. Because that's when they're trying to just win Diane's sacred treasure. Each of the sins has a sacred treasure, which multiplies their battle capability like a thousand fold or something. Um, so they're trying to win Diane's in this hand to hand tournament. And so they enter in King into it. And he gets into a fight with this harmless old man, who, of course, turns out to be a badass ancient monk or whatever. Um, and King's like trying to throw a punch and he's like missing the guy while he's staying still. They're like, yeah, King's really good with his sacred treasure when he can use his telekinesis, but he's fucking awful in hand to hand combat. Yeah, that was, that was quite the adventure, although it was uh, a bit easier for them to do that than it was for them to get Melodius' uh, sacred treasure where they had to run that chocobo race without getting hit by any birds. So you had to hit enough balloons to get your time under negative zero. 
That's not how that happens at all. Merlin just gives it to him, you fucking liar. <laughs> uh, I'm referencing Final Fantasy X, Nick. God damn it. Oh, a game get, that Nick they... has never played. From a franchise that Nick has never played. This will be appreciated on this podcast. <laughs> the audience, Nick. And then they get Merlin's by dodging 200 lightning bolts in a row in the Thunder Plains. And then they get Bond's by, I don't know, going on an airship. Fuck, I don't know. Nick, that, none of them were that easy. They all uh, involve giant obtrusive fucking uh, okay, time. Okay, okay, wait, hang on. Um, um, all right, so they get Escanors by winning a Blitzball tournament. That's actually one of them. There that's how go. they get Wakas. You had to okay. win the Blitzball campaign. The, oh, that's how you get his best volleyball <laughs> weapon. <laughs> yeah, essentially. Um, I feel like a big part of this series is my is I honest to God my favorite character is Hawk. I fucking love Hawk. The pig companion, the pig animal companion. I thought that this might be a point of contention between us because I can see very easily how Hawk could be annoying as hell because he's the scrappy do of this series. But I love him. <laughs> Cause I, okay. One of the three main characters that's introduced at the, st- at the top of the series is, you know, Billy Otis, our hero. Elizabeth, the princess who is going around trying to find the seven deadly sins so she can protect her kingdom. And Hawk, the pig that Meliodas keeps in his traveling bar, whose literal sole duty is to eat the table scraps that people drop on the floor because Meliodas is an awful cook and they don't like his food, but they like his beer. So they eat his food and they think it's terrible and they throw it away and Hawk eats it. (laughs) That's his job because he's a talking pig. I have no idea why I find Hawk so charming and hilarious, but I love him to fucking death. And I think it comes, it boils down to he's not just the comic relief. If it were literally just he does nothing but is useless and vain and stupid, then I would probably hate him. But there are little circumstances here and there placed intermittently where he is useful. Um, like when Elizabeth gets teleported into a prison. And Hawk randomly gets teleported along with her. <laughs> and Hawk is like, God, I have to go to the bathroom. And he rams the door down his breather. <laughs> he's essentially like a, just a more entertaining version of Happy. Like he's just that animal sidekick that's essentially around. But like, whereas Happy's pretty forgettable and doesn't really do a whole lot except be like, I like fresh. This like Hawk actually has more lines and has like a you're you you probably are going to have more extreme opinion, but I feel like you at least have the potential of really liking him like you do in your case. Whereas Happy, I feel like the best case scenario is like, oh yeah, I forgot about Happy. Um, because yeah, I mean Happy is just like I'm here too, unless he's like lusting over Carla or randomly growing huge so he can carry people to their destination. And then forgetting that he that he could be crone huge in order to keep Natsu warm, and so instead we just gotta take her clothes off. <laughs> um, Hawk is such a weird character to me because um, he's a talking pig who's traveling around with these massively powerful people, and he's vain as fuck because he's like, "I'm the main character, and it's my time to shine." And he does a cartwheel tackle to try and stop people, and then they just bash it into him. <laughs> This poor little thing. Um, and then it turns out he saves the world. He fucking saves the kingdom because when everyone is down, I'm like the final villain of the first arc is about is reached his like final demonic form, and everyone's getting defeated by like his black snow instant death power that he's unleashing over the entire kingdom in this massive cloud. Everyone is disabled, and uh, Elizabeth is going to hit be to uh, be captured by him. And Meli- he launches his final "If it touches you, you die" attack. And Meliodas, who's too exhausted to dodge it, and he won't get out of the way because if he does, then Elizabeth will be hit by it, and he's got no means of countering it. No one can can save him. And then Hawk shows up, and Hawk is like, "It's time for me to save the day," and but like, being sincere for once. And he just gets in the way of the attack and absorbs it and dies. And it was like, Hawk! And I'm like, Hawk! And Nick's saying, No! Like, oh, God, Hawk, you bastard! 
Nick closes and his browser. Like, I don't want to know anymore. It was just, they were just like, he was just an innocent little pig, you bastard. And Elizabeth like unlocks her super, like, Melody's is like, you've killed my best friend. I'm going to stop you. And a huge aura of power and erupts. And it's not coming from Meliodas. It's coming from Elizabeth, who's unlocked her super healing ability. And everyone who's got horrible injuries in the entire kingdom has been cured. Except for the dead people. The dead people stay dead. And this, it's this weird pseudo-comedic, pseudo-tragic moment where you look over at this just burnt, round pig. <laughs> flying. It's like, then maybe Hawk has... <laughs> <laughs> I like the no, thing, like everyone, everyone comes in and they're just like, man, Logan is such an emotionally powerful movie in the Nick Claus. He's like, yeah, yeah, whatever. But did I tell you about this fictional comedic pig? Okay, like oh, Logan is any less fictional. <laughs> in my heart, he's real, Nick. You're like, shut up, shut up about Wolverine. Let me tell you about this pig. People are saying you recant this a few years ago, which I don't remember in the fucking slightest, because I would always, hand to God, I would, half the time when you would cover a series that I didn't read, I would kind of tune you out just so I didn't spoil myself. <laughs> yeah, sure, that's the reason you I remember me out. some of the things that you recapped, like, let's all hold hands so I go to kill us. <laughs> let's all sing and hope we don't die. But I don't remember you recapping Hawk's death, certainly. I don't remember it either. I know I did. I, don't, I couldn't tell you how I felt about it at the time. But anyway, that happened, and I was like, no, Hawk! And then, of course, it turns out he's not dead. For some reason, it still has not been explained. There are hints that Hawk is not the entity that it seems that he is. Like, um... You see a flashback at one point to Meliodas' backstory, and he has this... Toucan? companion i think it's a toucan some sort of large beaked bird and it's implied that hawk is like the reincarnation of it or something because he had an animal companion in a previous life and now he's got hawk now and they could both talk and were weird um but hawk just wakes up from being dead somehow and he's this little tiny pig and he ends up regaining his mass when he eats a bunch of food and then it turns out he's got his own special ability, which is if he eats an animal that has magical powers, he can absorb those powers. And, oh my god, I have no idea why, why this gets me so much. Like, the first time that this happens, he's eaten a dragon, or he's, like, eaten his way out of a dead dragon's stomach after an actually powerful animal has defeated it or something. And so he shows up, and he's got horns and scales and miniature wings for tails, uh, for his ears, rather. And so he just shows up with this like this, this bizarre scaled monstrosity. He looks completely different. And, and he's like, and I have gotten stronger too. And he looks at him and he's keeping talking about something else. <laughs> just ignore him. <laughs> and he's like, I've gained magic powers, guys. Look, I can shoot fire from my nostrils. And he shoots fire from his nostrils and he burns himself. And he's like, oh! <laughs> I love Hawk. I, I'm I'm Best. glad you found this much of a, a, a companion, Hawk. <laughs> Your spirit animal has finally come to you. <laughs> Literally, this this pig that nobody's impressed by, except for Bond for some reason. Bond, Bond thinks that up. Hawk is the greatest. <laughs> Bond knows what's up, man. Oh yeah. I've gone on for five minutes about this stupid pig that I love so much. I think we need to probably start wrapping things up on this, uh, especially since we're going to be... It's been a long discussion. We saved the best for last. Hawk is the best. <laughs> uh, there was a bit where they like announced the results of the character popularity poll, which ended the exact way it should have, with Hawk being like, ah, you guys have to try harder. You have to try harder to get to number one. And it turns out that he's not number one. He's number 11. <laughs> he's just just outside the top 10, so he's not included in the countdown. So I'm like, why? The, the only way it could have ended. Because everyone, how can you not love Hawk? But you can't love him the most. Ex unless you're Nick. <laughs> <laughs> Nick's like, Hawk's the best. I mean, we all agree, but, you know, we can't yeah, all we say it. Right. Otherwise, no one would get any votes. <laughs> uh, right. I, I think that when it comes to seven deadly sins we, we start off on it talking about the problems that it has with the power levels and, and melodious and those things and then we kind of turned around to some of the stuff that's a lot more enjoyable about it. and i think that's kind of where you have to get into with this because as i was getting back into the series 
I was thinking like, man, I mean, there's a lot of issues where it has early on, you know, nothing really feels dramatically important because all these fights and opponents are just fodder, essentially, for them, and, you know, all these little things. And then, like, as I got in, I was like, yeah, there's actually some pretty cool fight scenes to this. Some of the characters are pretty fun, and, like, you know, there's a lot of kind of cool moments to it. It's nice that they have romance as an aspect of the story. And then there's stuff that kind of brings it down again. I'm like, God, I forgot how stupid power levels are. I forgot how fucking annoying this is. Uh, but it kind of picks itself back up as the story starts to move in a bolder, more kind of uh, tense direction. There's mm -hmm. faults all around, but I think that the the series is worth it if you're into Battle Shonen and you're looking for something different, especially something out of you know Shonen Jump. If you don't read anything outside the magazine except maybe Fairy Tale, I think this is a good one to kind of go into because it's not unfamiliar territory. I could easily see this running in Jump. It's not as though it has any content that would be beyond it. And even though we've kind of pointed out some of, like, the weird sexual aspects of it, you know, some of the sexual harassment things or things of that nature. The way Merlin dresses, just <laughs> wearing heart panties now. Hey, Nick, let's not, let's not start critiquing Merlin's fantastic choice of attire, okay? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's worth noting that this series does not ever cross into fairy oh, tale actually, realms. What bothers me most is that she has Escanor like wait on her while she's taking a bath so he's being really weird around her feet it's like <laughs> Nick you know what I don't think you and Rex Ryan are going to be friends anymore <laughs> <laughs> uh... but no I, I think the fact that it's it's not you know as shameless as fairy tale and it actually does have I think a, a bit more of an enjoyable story than to it too it, you know maybe I guess this is the closest thing to like fairy tale but done right I guess is almost a way to put it. That's a good the, way of describing it, honestly. They actually do feel like people who you wouldn't really want to be like, yeah, look at these noble heroes, because all of them are kind of scumbags in their own way, too. Um, yeah, like, uh, I like the way that the the rogue qualities of the characters, I mean, they actually fit on at least the majority of them. Even, I think Diane is probably, like, the most innocent of them. Mm -hmm. But even so... She is, you know, a giant, so you, I can understand, like, the ostracization there. Uh, I mean, you know, she also uh, has the sin that I always kind of considered the least egregious of the group, too, where it's like, oh, no, she I, I want what other people. people, I want what other people have. Like, yeah, a lot of us do. Thou shalt not covet. By the way, the Ten Commandments aren't all named after commandments, which is weird to me. No, that confused, well, because that, it'd be boring as shit. There'd be three of them, you're like, this is all just the same thing. <laughs> honor God, honor God's name, honor God's day, this sucks! <laughs> there's, a, there's nothing you can do with that! I and then there's like two at the end that are the same too. It's like, thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's goods, and thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's wife. Wait a minute, that's just that's just envy and lust. <laughs> By the way, explain the Ten Commandments to children as I was taught as young as kindergarten is very strange to me. I mean, they had to just jump over adultery like it was a joke within the church. Like the priest would be like, number six, thou shalt not commit adultery. Whatever that is. <laughs> but then I'm like, even the one where it's like, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. It's like, that's still basically like, adultery. Yeah, I'm like, isn't that the same? They're like, look, shut that's up. That's lusting after your neighbor's wife instead of flat out fucking her. Like, if you want to go back to fucking 2000 BC and you want to write the goddamn stone tablets, you I mean, go ahead and do it. That's like literally the guy, the guy chiseling them down. It's like, okay, thou shalt not uh, sleep outside of marriage. Thou shalt not think about sleeping outside thy marriage. I like to think that like he was getting them from God and he's like, gotcha. Well, what's on TV tonight? Wait, what was that last one? Ah, shit, I wasn't paying attention. And I'll just do the neighbor's wife thing again. It's, <laughs> thou shalt not commit adultery. It's important enough to be in there twice. I sincerely hope, because it looks as though with this flashback, which, by the way, has been horribly boring yes. uh, to me uh, in the last 20 chapters. Just, uh, but it, Seriously, I think at this point we're into the problem of there's too many goddamn characters with not enough to do. The, I think that, honestly, like the first 100 chapters of Seven Deadly Sins, like if that had been like the entire series i've been like you have to go read this it's freaking great uh the fact that there was promise of more got me really excited i don't think that it has matched the level the the level that I, of expectation that i had from the first hundred chapters more problems have cropped up especially in terms of the way that it feels like some of the rem especially the the relationship between king and diane has very much been put on hold because like all right this is the one relationship in this entire series that 
We're not going to give you closure on it until it counts. So fuck you. She's forgotten everything again for like the third time. <laughs> um, King will have to kill his best friend to get to get back. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but uh, I, uh, I, I get the feeling also just as a final note before we end on, because I do enjoy the series overall, but I hope that things kind of get more f- placed on actually building up the villains, not in terms of their power, but in terms of who they are and mm-hmm. what they want to do and stuff. Cause it seems like it's kind of run into the problem of here's this character, which means it's their turn to be defeated now. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I get the feeling that after the 10, com- we're done with this 10 commandments arc that we're probably going to revisit the goddess clan. Uh, and I hope at that point we get something like the seven holy virtues. Uh, I was about to bring that up because I was like, you know, seven deadly sins. It's, a, it's an aspect that's used in a whole lot of fantasy things. No one ever brings up the seven uh, holy virtues because I looked at them, I, like I had to remind myself what they are. I'm like, these all suck. Uh, These are boring. Faith, lame. faith, charity, hope, fortitude, temperance, prudence. All so close. Oh, so hang on. So close. Temperance, prudence, fortitude, charity, lo- uh, charity, hope, and faith. It's, it's a band name. <laughs> that just threw you <laughs> off, I know. It's not going to help. <laughs> um... Courage. No. That's 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 basically fortitude, right? Uh, I forget. <laughs> it rhymes with schmustus, Nick. Justice, of course. <laughs> justice. Now there is the, the four cardinal virtues, which is prudence, temperance, courage, and justice. And then there, and then faith, charity, and hope are like three separate from them. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know why they're divided up that way exactly. Because they're boring. <laughs> they're not nearly as cool as the evil. They're not as cool as faith. As faith. <laughs> as faith. What it, charity is essentially love in the seven holy virtues. So yeah, faith, love, and hope. Yeah. When you go when you go from that down to temperance, prudence. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You don't really say them with like a, fic- a fucking finger up. Like oh, it's about reverence for your elders. I'm like ah. Oh. Fortitude and justice. Fortitude and justice. Pretty badass. Temperance and prudence. Uh. <laughs> like prudence. Isn't like prudence always kind of sound kind of negative? Like you're being mm. such a prude. <laughs> like look, always, it's always... about being frugal. Okay. <laughs> I wish it was that. Like the boiled down version. Of, like cheapness. Thriftiness. I mean, the. Yeah, I mean. Seven Deadly Sins have always been probably, like, the single aspect of, like, the, the mythos of Christianity that has fascinated me the most. And then when I found out that there were seven holy virtues to oppose them, I was like, oh, awesome. So, so yeah, uh, about, that's just, like, an observation. It's not even, like, a... Anyway, yeah. Let's move on to recap. <laughs> no, no, ta- no elegant tangent for us. <laughs> not this week. I mean, I could just go on about how much I love Hawk some more, but, you know. <laughs> There's only so many hours in the day, Nick. Um, all right. So we uh, don't have uh, My Hero Academia this week. It's going to be off, I think, for the next couple of weeks, uh, I believe. It's going to be off next week as well, I think. Um, yeah, very possibly. Um, and that's fine. In my mind, you know, we kind of noted how last chapter was, like, kind of incomplete at various points, mm-hmm. so... I feel it's uh, good for Horikoshi Sensei to rest up. I wouldn't want to have another um, World Trigger like scenario happening. Mm-hmm. So, get your. Uh, rest. I should make a note as we, because uh, we're going to be kicking off with Fairy Tale, because uh, I'm going on Crunchyroll for this. If you get a Crunchyroll subscription, you can actually read literally all of Seven Deadly Sins. Yes. Literally. And it's a good subscription just to get in general, because not only will you get that, you get access to the whole video archive too. Yeah, it's and... it's pricier than a Shonen Jump subscription, but I mean, you get anime uh, stuff on top of the manga that they have available simultaneously. Yeah, you pay monthly for it, but yeah, you also get the whole full catalog, and they have a lot. That's where you can get all JoJo's, you can get Dragon Ball Super, you can get uh, all sorts of all One Piece, uh, World Triggers on there if you wanted to watch that. <laughs> amazing anime um you can, you can get a lot on there for it so that anime where with all the characters standing still while their mouths move <laughs> yeah <laughs> osamu we should go fight that thing yes you are right yuma let's do do that now okay we did it good job 
High fives all around. All right, so... <laughs> Uh, fairy tale chapter 525. Why did the emperor never love his child? It sounds like an ancient riddle, doesn't it? <laughs> it sounds like it'd be a much more interesting story than we get thus far, but <laughs> it's a fucking stupid. <laughs> so last time August basically taunted Gildards and Kana by saying, you know, do you love your dad? Do you love your daughter? What's going to happen when I kill one of you and separate our bond? So Gildards like, Fucking, he turns into like a fucking gorilla. Like he starts like hunching over on his back, like, ooh, ooh, you won't kill my daughter. And he starts getting like stupidly angry. It's, I know it's trying to be like intense. Like, how could you say this to my kid? It doesn't feel that way just because of how goofy he kind of looks during it it's all. Like, guys, you're in a war. Of course, there's going to be threats around. If he had actually done something to hurt Kana, I could understand Gildard's going all Hulk. Yeah. But he hasn't, as of yet. Uh, mm -hmm. And August just continues to kind of parade about this idea that he just can't comprehend a parent's love for their child. He's just mm -hmm. like, a child loves his parents. Should a parent not love his child? Oh, but then why does the emperor not love his child? And everyone's like, what the fuck what are, the fuck talking are you talking about? about? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, no, no, I've got a very obtuse parable to tell you first. Literally. That will then be addressed to see like, you're not around yeah. to witness. Well, you get, we get, you know, August, you know, is like, ah, oh, should a parent love his child? And he goes like, yes, ah, oh, then why has the Emperor never loved his child? And then they just keep on fighting, and Khan and Gildart are like, stay away, no, I'll fight for myself, don't be overprotective. Sorry, Gildart. Sorry, Khan, you're just always gonna be my little girl, and I, ca I gotta be protective of you. Why did the Emperor <laughs> never love his child? It's like, is he broken? Is he like a toy that only says one phrase? And he keeps saying this. And it does get addressed, because we then cut over to Licarde, who, if you recall, you know, had the ecstasy magic or whatever, who is Zareph's son, I guess. And it's just kind of weird, because August is the one constantly saying this phrase over and over again. And it's being addressed here in a scene that him and nobody in that fight are actually present for. It's like, so why is he saying it? I just want an audience. Listen, <laughs> guys, I don't know. The you... emperor has never loved his child. I want you to know that. <laughs> Whether well, swinging or spitting, my discipline is unforgiven. It's like, uh... We devils rock in ambient levels. <laughs> we set loose among hot tunes to instrumentals. <laughs> <laughs> but really, why doesn't the emperor love his own <laughs> child? It's like, I fucking hate you, August. <laughs> uh, so, Licarde's literally crawling. To fairy tale right now i guess just no one in the entire like line between random ass battlefield to fairy tale has like seen this guy and been like hey stop don't move random dude who is pretty crazy powerful uh and he manages to crawl basically all the way into fairy tale meanwhile fair uh natsu and Zeraph are in the middle of their fight and uh what's her stupid mavis telepathically contacts Gray and, and Lucy and is like, get out of there, leave Natsu to his thing, come to me, I have something I need to tell you, but I, you know, someone might be on this connection, someone might be <laughs> eavesdropping in on yeah, my no, magic it's, phone it's, call. It's too important for me to tell, to tell you in your brain, I have to tell you with, with my mouth. Yeah, someone might be listening in on my brain telepathy magic. <laughs> No one... I strongly believe, by the way, that Mavis is 90% Hero's way of just getting his foot fetish out. Because she just never puts on fucking shoes. Seriously. I, I think Mavis is a lot of fetishes for Hero just combined. I mean, there's the lowly, and there's the just the lesbian. Yeah, right. So, I mean... We should, like, rank uh, Fairy Tales female characters in terms of, like, the shamelessness in which, with which, the, like... The number of fetishes that they're a vehicle for. I think Lucy oh. is number one just because of longevity. But, <laughs> but Lucy doesn't occupy that many. I, I guess the one she probably hits the most is the Bondage King. Because she's the one who ends up getting that probably Tied the up, most. Captured. But then Urza hits that too. And she hits the big BDSM one. So She had the, she had the really out there one with uh, what's-her-face, the demon. Kyoka, yeah. Kyoka, yeah. Plus, how do, we, how do we then qualify the Elseworld versions of them? 
because Elseworld oh. was, a, was her own mixed bag. I feel like she was like a short hair fetish, just like that manifested itself. She's like, I'm gonna cut my hair really short for no reason. And then there was, then there was, there was busty Wendy because mm. yeah, and badass Lucy, like badass biker Lucy. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> There's a lot. There's a lot of female characters that are exploited in fairy tale. We might be at this for months researching. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then next top ten on a, a bonus spot. Uh, so yeah, or Lucy's like, all right, now Natsu, we're gonna leave, but don't you lose this fight. I'm busy. <laughs> Seraph like basically like jumps away after this. He's like, ah, oh, I didn't do. I, who knew this could be so fun? You know, the fate of Mandy's on the line, but. Oh, I feel more alive in this moment than anything else. Maybe this is the curse or contradiction I have. I don't really understand how I feel. Anyways, I'm enjoying this. And that's like a full page spread with just a sound effect that says gloom, 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 gloom. gloom. <laughs> I'm like, what's making the sound? <laughs> is it just his face? What's possibly making a sound effect there? Uh, but before Natsu can follow back up with that uh Licardi shows up tries to cast sleep on him it's not enough natsu's able to like basically stay kind of awake he's like starting to fade but he's he's not completely out of it and Licardi's like hurry now father father you can kill him let his white soul ascend to the heavens cut away flashback i think this is master hades and he's basically looking over the crystal trap that mavis has been in and he's like as your action says it, there's still life within Mavis. Should I ignore it? Or should I kill her? Or should I keep her alive? Hmm. Kill her? <laughs> keep her alive. Kill her? Keep her alive. Why is he considering killing her? <laughs> I'm like, why do you need to kill her? Like, is it... I, I, the only way I could see it is if he was trying to say, like, a merciful... Like, if he was going to, like, essentially euthanize her. But... I mean, it's not like it's it's not like it's an actual coma. It's a magic crystal they could potentially free her from. Like, I I, I think the logic kind of almost has to be in a world of magic that yeah, like maybe we could undo this curse. So yeah, I'm not really sure why he's doing it. Anyway, it's not exactly the real world scenario of she could be brain dead and and yeah. Uh, we cut out of the flashback so we can see Zareph blowing a giant uh, fiery hole through Lacarde, and he says, "Do not interfere." Cut back to August. Why did the Why emperor did never? <laughs> He's Jerry said. Why did the emperor never love his child? What's, What's up with that? Why did the emperor never love his child? It's a mystery. Why wouldn't he? You're a parent. You have a child. You're supposed to love him. Oh, uh, Kramer. I don't know how to feel about this fairy tale chapter so much. I. I... <laughs> I don't, I'm gonna, I'm I don't gonna, see how that last flashback relates to what's going on around it. I don't know. It doesn't seem like it connects completely yet, and it's kind of weird. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, my issue with it is that this this why did the emperor never love his child is immediately reaching into the the category of. Uh, where do whores go from the Game of Thrones books where Tyrion just kept repeating that phrase so often that you just like, go fuck yourself, drown in the ocean, Tyrion. I'm so tired <laughs> of hearing this. Uh, the arc words, though. <laughs> <laughs> we have to repeat the ad nauseum. Yeah. Oh, God. Um, I'm sure we'll learn more, I guess, in the next chapter. Or maybe not, you know, but... Yeah, this whole thing this seems very unnecessary. I guess that it might be driving home the point that oh, Zara, I, I guess out of all of Zara's creations, Nats is the only one he really cares about. I forgot. The, the, I think what he's referring to is the child oh, Mavis in is pregnant. Mavis. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I guess Whatever. it's did Mavis ever love Zareph, and he's then taking that out upon Lacarde. It seems it all it all seems kind of this character wasn't important enough in this and throughout this entire arc I think to really merit this backstory is the thing you know who who was Mavis's child it wasn't it is implied that it was Ricardo okay I think I don't know probably well then why doesn't the emperor love his own child that doesn't answer the know. question 
I guess because he hates. Well, no, because he kind of likes Beavis. He's got complicated. I'm sure that they'll explain it. You know what, Nick? This all makes sense. He explained it just a couple of fucking pages earlier where he's like, it's my curse of contradiction. It doesn't have to make sense. He's insane. He's wacko. He's bonkers. He's, he, he just chases cars around all day. He doesn't know what he'd do if he caught one. Gloom, 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 gloom. <laughs> Whatever. All right. So, why didn't he? <laughs> so, why didn't he ever love his child? All right, we are going to move on then to Food Wars, Shokugeki no Soma. Um, all right, so last time, Erina made her big stand in defiance of her father, relinquishing her seat on the Council of Ten, to proclaim that she would stand on Soma's side in the Team Shokugeki. Uh, I like how we... Uh, don't really see exactly how Azami feels about this. Like his shot, his face isn't really focused on as uh, he makes his departure. So you know he's like, "Huh, you've learned to talk back, Arina. Very well, but when you lose, you will look, then you're not going to be expelled. You will use your skill and talent for the betterment of Central for the rest of your life. You will follow my orders to the letter without fail. No further defiance will be permitted in my w- in my way. Anyway." I'm like, really, they leave. I'm like, there's no way you could enforce that. <laughs> no, not really. No. <laughs> like, this goes beyond the school. <laughs> no way that you can even like, even if you drew up a contract, like <laughs> this is very illegal. <laughs> um, yeah, and I, 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 I think it's interesting that we don't actually see the way that he's reacting to Aaron's big act of defiance. Like you know, so we don't see the emotional reaction he has to this moment. Um, so he's treating it very in a very business-like way, even this act of rebellion, but who knows if it's actually bothering him or not. Uh, then we get our title page, which is uh, our heroes brushing their teeth. Is this a thing in Japan? Because I've noticed that it happened in one of the One Piece openings as well. It's like all the characters on the cliffside brushing their teeth together. Is that like just a thing that like in, I guess, situations where there's multiple people? Like it's like, yeah, whatever, we'll all be in the bathroom brushing our teeth together. I like the cover page. I think it looks cool. Well, not cool, but it's it looks, you know, interesting. It's well drawn, mm-hmm. and it's like a nice little introspective into them. I just don't get it. Also, like, the way that Soma brushes his teeth are very... angry, like, oh, die, fuck, die. <laughs> Even Arina has a lot of, like, intense focus in her. It's like she's blushing almost, like, I've really got to get these teeth cleaned. <laughs> Actually, it kind of looks like she's eating her toothbrush now. <laughs> <laughs> she's like, this toothbrush is so delicious. <laughs> So, Soma gives Arina props for standing up to her father, and she's got this very intense look on her face. Uh, just like she's like blushing, and like steam is coming off of her body. Was, mm-hmm. um, and uh, she's kind of got newfound det- determination, uh, and also she's on an adrenaline high because of uh, how much she got worked up in order to tell her father off. So she uh, kind of goes back a little bit to her old ways. You know, she strikes this very dignified pose and she's like, you know, we will secure a victory and and, and, and uh, saying stuff like that. Uh, and she says specifically, you shall be my loyal entourage who dutifully serve and revere their queen, be honors. <laughs> <laughs> I just love the wording of that more than anything else. Um... But, you know, people are kind of observing, like, you know, you know what, this does suit her, anyway, acting like this. The royal dignity of a queen. Which, honestly, I kind of agree, you know, it was nice to see Irina evolving, getting to know people better, but one of the things that I think drew people to her to begin with was the fact that she would, she had this ego to her. Yes. This sense of entitlement. And it's nice to see that, even though she is evolved as a character, and she's, you know, seen the light, so to speak, that she can have that side to her. She hasn't completely abandoned that old aspect of her. Um, Soma then gets really upset because, like, you know, Takumi and, and Megumi are like, alright, this is great, you know, that Arian is all confident now, and Soma's like, hang on a second, which one of you is deciding who, who, who since when do you decide who gets to be, like, the first seat at the top of the council? And Arian's like, you bitch, you know who's better than you, commoner. <laughs> And of course, they just you know are getting this big argument over over it. And uh, Soma pulls a real bitch move because he calls over to his dad and is like, "You tell her who's gonna be number one, Dad." 
It's like, what do you think your dad's gonna say? Is your dad constantly <laughs> shit on you? <laughs> and I, I love how Erin responds to this, which is not, hey, don't go, don't go begging your dad for help. She says, getting Chef Saiba involved is against the rules. <laughs> what rules? <laughs> She's lawful good now, Nick. Everything is rules. She has to follow it. <laughs> um, and, uh, but, uh, Simon just kind of gives her props for standing up to her father, though. Um, but, uh, someone's like, all right, well, yeah, if, if Makiri's gonna go that far and make a big deal, then okay, we should step up too. So he says to Megami and Takumi to take out their student booklets. And they're like, what are you talking about? And he's just like, let's do it. Oh crap! I left mine in my backpack on the bus on the on the train because he's a goof. Um, yeah, and uh, they give their booklets over to Arena, and Soma says, "There, those are our lives, and they're in your hands now. After all, you're the one who convinced us that we could all survive these exams in the first place, and that makes you our princess now." But who gets the first seat is another uh, kettle of fish. So just so you know. It's a nice moment, um, and I, I'm really liking the dynamic. I'm not sure that I necessarily agree with having these exact four be our characters still for our cast, but I will acknowledge that you know the advantage of that is that having them be around each other uh, longer and longer is letting us appreciate the relationship between them more as we go forward. I think and we just all agree we'd replace Takumi with just about anybody else. <laughs> Almost any Bunhead girl. Okay, hang on. <laughs> I'm like, all right, well, you know, maybe not. <laughs> um, we cut over to Dojima talking with Senzemon, and Dojima's like, so did you know that all of this would happen when we were doing the scrimmage last, last night? And Senzemon's like, what, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> not psychic. But he says, I simply thought it best that she learn a thing or two from the Yuki heroes. And uh, then we get a kind of unexpected flashback uh, for, from Dojima's perspective. Like, I certainly didn't see this coming um, in the last chapter. I thought, if anything, we would get it a little bit earlier. Um, but what we see is uh, the immediate aftermath of uh, Saiba's departure from uh, Tatsuki. And uh, I like, you know, some little details, like how a couple of different people are reacting to it. June is there and she's like, I didn't get to pay him back for all the times he made me his guinea pig. <laughs> but she's also just upset that he's not there. Um, and Dojima has fallen into kind of a depression because yeah, he's like, he's blaming himself for me. He's like, you know, if I'd only paid better attention, if I hadn't been so oblivious, then maybe he wouldn't have had to leave. And, and Senzaman comes in while he's feeling sorry for himself. And he's like, oh, that's just your own hubris talking. Uh, whether or not the obstacle he's facing is nothing but a detriment to him is something only Joichiro Saiba can decide. Likewise, the pain and frustration you now feel weighs only on your decision about your future and no one else's. So, um, And uh, then he offered Dojima you know, a position, which he ended up taking. Uh, and uh, Dojima kind of threw himself into his work, we learn, in order to sort of make amends for his what he perceived as his failure to look out for his friend. Now he's looking out for all these other students instead. But then one day out of the blue, you see that Joichiro actually contacted him. And it's like, yeah, I'm working at this little shop, and I'm married, and I've got a kid, and uh, yeah, uh, anyway, I've got to go, but the place that I'm at, and like, there's like a bad connection between them, so he doesn't get the name out. And uh, so he, sa you know, he says, I'm at the you know, Hira place, and uh, he doesn't get the whole name out. There's distortion in the middle of the name. And so Digi was like, I didn't hear that. Did you repeat it? Hang on. No, you give, me, give me your address. I've got to go now. Bye. Uh, and, uh, and but right before he hung up, he said, I'm cooking again, and I'm happy to be doing it. So, And, of course, that comforted Dojima. And then years later, he came across Soma separately. And was like, oh, Yukihira, where have I heard that before? And... Uh, when he realized the connection between the two of them, he's like, yeah, you're one of the people who saved him from that raging storm, you're his own child. Soma Yukihira, as Joichiro's friend of many years, I must say thank you for being born to him. And uh, it's a cool little moment uh, seeing 
the way that Dojima has been thinking about Soma uh, this whole time, but just kind of quietly keeping it to himself hmm. rather than being like, oh, yeah, you're Joichiro's son. Well, da, 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 you know, um, I just, I do just, I do still feel that this flashback is a little bit weirdly placed. Um, I don't know, it, it flows kind of strangely into this moment, but it was nice to have it all. And uh, then we just kind of get narration that is basically skipping ahead to uh, they're arriving at the venue for the final confrontation. So. so, yeah, that's the chapter. So I, I may mention this on uh, the Weekly Manga Recap Twitter, but I, I got a vibe from this chapter that I, I couldn't shake where I was like, I wonder if, because everything starts to feel like it's speeding up really quickly if the series is is maybe ending soon i know there was a point where you know it wasn't doing so well in the rankings mm -hmm. and that's why they kind of very quickly shifted to cutting down this advancement exam and then did the the flash forward or the flashback and things like that and i know a couple weeks ago it actually ranked dead last um in the rankings it's, it's usually in the middle and i think that's where it's been this past week as well um, so I, I don't think it's necessary that it's been so low in the rankings that that's why it, if it is, it, it's happening. This is all entirely, you know, assumption on my part. None of this has been really confirmed either way. But there, there is a part of me that wonders if maybe that's me, what, where we might be heading. Because we are starting to, I think, kind of tie a lot of things up. Um, you mentioned, like, the Dojima flashback there is it's something that i feel like could have had its own point later on in the story it doesn't really feel like it's appropriate necessarily here mm. and part of me is like i wonder if it's here because it's something that you know the the writer wanted to get out now before it kind of got lost um mm. again this is entirely guesswork on my part you know none of this is confirmed and please don't take it like it is I i'm speaking hypothetically here um and it might not be, you know, maybe they just said they didn't want to focus on this month long training to like, hey, you'll get it, you know, we'll get it in flashback during the event itself or whatever. Um, it just struck me as kind of interesting, the fact that we are kind of very quickly jumping ahead to the the battle on the island, how there wasn't much of a, a, a build up now to this actual final confrontation. Like, it's not like the villains had much to say or anything like that. They already kind of started settling the idea of who will take the top seat in the council if they win, things like that. Um, I want we'll to see. I think it'll be very interesting to see how the next few chapters go. Because if those start blasting through this contest very quickly, then that's where I think you should start having a little bit of like, hmm, mm -hmm. I'm wondering about this. But considering the type of series it is, the fact that it's hit over 200 chapters. Honestly, it wouldn't be too surprising if it just started to wind down naturally at this point anyway. Mm. Um, and uh, looking back, uh, it was during the Joichiro flashback uh, a couple of months ago, and that's usually around the time that uh, you start to see reaction to chapters reflected in the rankings. So if you go back, you know, two months, we weren't very impressed with that whole flashback sequence. Uh, it was more a matter of, we'll appreciate this later, probably then yeah what a great else. thing at the time yeah mm -hmm. so maybe that's it um maybe things will start to look m uh, more up as we move forward with this but i definitely see your point it could very well end up being that it's not going to be as expansive uh, a series and needs to be more focused just because things are kind of enthusiasm might be starting to die down for it so which is a shame I, I really enjoy it i'm hoping that we get along uh continuation out of this there's a lot i feel this the story still has to accomplish but mm -hmm. uh yeah, there's parts of me that's yeah, it, a little it, it, right can't be, it can't be quite as ambitious because it kind of wanted to be but again if, if that ends up happening to clarify for everybody listening <laughs> hypothetical none of this is confirmed so yeah. don't take my word or anything on this podcast as us saying seven De or uh seven daily since uh food wars is ending seven daily since is definitely not ending soon <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, let's move on to our jump starts. Uh, we'll go in alphabetical order. So uh, this, we'll start with Demon Prince Diary, Demon Prince Poro's diaries, rather. Page three, Poro on a date. Poro gets a girlfriend who's been after him for a while because she's like uh, arranged him by marriage. She is a very strong girl. She's very forward, wants to just get on that and make some babies. Um, 
and uh, poor ends up uh, protecting her from really strong demons that attack. Uh, she gets poisoned, and he ends up kissing her to save her, and this act of romance gets her all shy, so she is intimidated when he is forward with her, and that is the chapter. Yeah, basically. Um... Honestly, I like this chapter a bit more than the previous one, but... Yeah, it just it's the same thing for me where it's like, eh, I just I have no heart in for this series. It's probably perfectly fine, just not my cup of tea at all. So I've basically tuned out of this series at this point. Which that's the end of the jump start. But again, we want to reiterate this. If you like Demon Prince Poro and you want to see more of it, mm. then you should go to uh Viz's uh, Shonen Jump uh poll, re response poll. And this applies to all three of the jump starts or even just like the series in general. If you want to make what series you like known, you should go take the survey. Slash WSJ hyphen survey is where you can take it. And it really literally only takes a couple of minutes in order yeah, to fill out. Yeah. By the by on that. So one of the questions you'll get in the survey, and I didn't realize this at the time. Uh, I haven't been able to listen to the Shonen Jump podcast in quite a few weeks. But one of the questions that now is I in their that. survey uh, that I just noticed this past week, and I listened to the episode, is a question that they're using for a new game on the Shonen Jump podcast. And I don't know if I need to like come in there and be like, Man, you, did you get this from us? What's going on here? They're essentially doing a Family Feud style game on there that I can't help but feel might be slightly influenced by Weekly Manga Recaps Trollo T Trivia family feud portion of Trollo T's Trivia Bleach Edition Nick yeah. versus Tech. See, we have a, see we, what we do is we have a trademark on stealing another game. <laughs> we, <laughs> we, we were the first manga podcast to steal the family feuds formula <laughs> and not bother to even give it a different name, all right? You might think you're high and mighty, giving it a slightly varied name, but just know oh. we're the first one to do this. So, if you'd like to help participate in their game that maybe is stealing some of the already stolen intellectual property from Weekly Manga Recap, <laughs> you can do it. Just answer the survey. It's on there. Um, the question that I got uh, on my survey was, uh, who is the best couple in Shonen Jump? I don't know if you got a different one or not. Yeah, that's that's what's in there. Mm-hmm. Oh, hold on, wait. Okay, we can't do it this week. <laughs> but next week, all of us take the survey, no matter what the question is, everyone put in honey mustard. <laughs> everyone puts in honey mustard next week into the survey. I, You're awful. No, we can do this, okay? <laughs> we can do this. I want them to let them know. I just want you to know. I want you, I want you guys to know that this is not an official weekly manga recap uh, effort. This is going. To Fuck be, you! This is official. <laughs> this is official weekly manga recap. All of you fuckers put honey mustard in next week's poll. You guys suck. All right. <laughs> Our next jump start. The new one that we got this week is Doctor Stone from the writer of iShow Twenty One and the artist of Sun Ken Rock. So the team of Richiro Inagaki and Boichi. Um, That's who this artist is. Gotcha. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we start off with just this this page that just says, "On that day, every human on Earth turned to stone." Well, that's quite a start. And then we get um, a kind of school life setup, very Did- bizarre one, as we get introduced to our two main characters, one of whom has very bizarre hair. Like, did you, seriously, what what does he put in his hair? Like, <laughs> did you ever, uh, when you were in school taking like English classes, did a teacher ever tell you that like the first sentence of your story is the one, the most important one? Because that's where you hook people in. If it's not interesting, the people won't keep I've, reading. I, I think I've, I have definitely heard that piece of advice. I don't know if my teacher specifically said it. Okay, because that's something I've always kept in mind, even though I, I don't know if I find it to be as true as I first thought at the time. At the time, I was like, oh, my teacher's so smart. Of course it's the most important thing. <laughs> but this is definitely one where you're like, ooh, what's, ooh. all right, let's, you got me. Let's see. Yeah, because, you know, you just see the, the earth and then you see a bunch of people on the street. Not only have they turned to stone, but like moss is growing over them. Their clothes have faded away over their stone petrified forms. So... Thank turned to God. stone at turned stone for a while. Thank God the stone didn't manifest over their nipples, though. 
everyone's as smooth as Barbie dolls. <laughs> um, so I honestly forget these guys' names because I, I just kind of refer to them as, as, as uh, like flamehead smart asshole and muscle bound idiot. There's uh, um, there's there's uh, strong dude and this version's uh, Haruma. Yeah, Hiruma, if he were like way less entertaining, honestly. <laughs> well, it's 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 a uh, down not I just want to say down syndrome Haruma. It's a uh, uh, what, what would you call it? Mexican low, non non uh, low en- low energy Haruma. Oh, the Mexican non union non union. <laughs> I mean, he's got a, he's got a, 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 a night an interesting thing where he's like he offers him like a a quote-unquote love potion and the he's like here use this in order to confess to use Uriha, and it will definitely work and instead he pours it out and he's like no i can't cheat my way into her heart and so they look over and it's like um was that really a love potion no it's just ordinary gasoline well, then why did you want him to drink it because i knew he would not drink it and by the way i want to make a point here for the guy that is the smart one the super scientific one he uses the phrase 10 billion percent a whole lot. <laughs> That's how sure he is, Nick. 10 billion percent. <laughs> now, you can have 10 billion percent, as in the proportion of it increased by 10 billion percent. It increased 100 million times, therefore it increased 10 billion percent. There is no such thing as a 10 billion percent chance. That's impossible. It's yeah. also worth noting how dumb this dude must be. How do you not smell gasoline? It's one of the most distinct <laughs> smells out there. Incredibly. It's just it's just in a fucking bottle, like with no quirk at the top of it or anything like that. You'd smell it immediately. <laughs> so uh, Musclehead ends up going to the girl he wants to confess to, Yuzuriha, who has a hair clip that looks like headphones. See, I didn't notice that because I was too busy being distracted by her freaky human, like, alien eyeballs. There, I do not find what's attractive about her because her face is wrong. There's something monstrous about it. Like, th- to me, I'm like, this is a Junji Ito character. We just haven't realized it yet. Like, he's going to break her out of the stone and her mouth's just going to start expanding and just swallow him whole like a snake. And we're like, of course she was a monster. Look at those freakish eyeballs. I will give credit, though. You're not going to mistake like the, the main characters in this for anyone else between Frost died super <laughs> except one bang that goes down past my chin uh, scientist guy and then mega eyebrows dude with Scar uh, and then uh, the headphones headband creepy eyes girl. <laughs> Nick. You be the scientist, I'll be the, the big eyebrow guy, we'll cosplay these guys. God. <laughs> um, so, guy's about to confess to Yuzuriha when suddenly there is a massive burst of light off on the horizon. They're like, oh, what's that? And uh, he gets in front of Yuzuriha, uh, and just like instinctively tries to bodily shield her, and, she, and, he, and he tells her, hold on to the tree! sudden like you see he's just turned to stone and all around the world everyone turns to stone but they can still think they can still uh realize what's going on and you see like uh people just have frozen in mid-action like a guy was walking down the stairs and so he's tipping over because he's turned to stone uh and people are thinking to themselves like what's going on i can't move and everything's dark i can't speak someone help me like am i am i having a stroke what's going on People are on a plane when they've turned to stone. The plane crashes because no one's flying it. Um, and uh, they, their bodies shatter. And so you can see that they've actually turned to stone all the way through their bodies. As opposed to just like... Because uh, uh, you see in the big two-page spl- uh, splash at the beginning, like the characters are emerging from stone. But no, they've actually turned flat out to stone. But can still think somehow because brains work that way. Um but uh, there are people who are thinking like, oh, I, you know, like I can feel my consciousness like, slipping away, you know, because I, I can't feel anything. So they kind of just like a lot of people just kind of give up, basically. Um, and the world goes dark. But then our main character is like, no, I can't give up. If I get careless for a second, I'll fade away. I, you know, I can't move, so I've got to maintain concentration. And he has a flashback to finding a stone bird earlier on. 
Like, uh, in the morning, I found this bird statue thing, but I was certain it was the real thing because I saw a bird that was just like it. A friend of mine uploaded a picture of a bird that was just like this. It's like the skin and feathers got all hard. Oh, man, maybe something's making this bird sick. And he goes to the vet, and he sees Yuzuriha there, and she's like, oh, come on. That bird's just a sculpture, right? But you still came to the vet? You're so dumb, it's embarrassing. It's like, oh, you're right. Yeah, I'm stupid. Wait a minute, why is she at the vet too? And she pulls out another bird. She's like, yeah, I'm kind of stupid too, I guess. And it's like, aww. They're both idiots. They deserve each other. Did, did they... we comment on the fact that Donald Trump got killed? What? Did you not see this? In the, uh, uh, page 20, or I guess 21, it cuts to oh, that is clearly Trump, the Oval it? Office. And it's the first instance we get of Donald Trump being represented in manga. And he gets killed. He's like, no, I'm dying. This is bad. This bad hombres. Ah. How will I tell people about how huge, huge my hands are if I'm stone? Nah. <laughs> anyway, uh, right I uh, didn't realize, and now this is maybe in, like, just unbelievably sad. I missed the three panels of the very, very tiny dog. Running yeah, around the little is, that's not stone, and its owner is that is dead, fucking but... heartbreaking. I will wait for you. <laughs> More than that, Nick, have you seen uh, uh, Norbert? No, okay, I'm about to blow your mind, Nick. Okay. This is this is going to hold on, Nick. Do you have a helmet? Because you're gonna probably need it to keep your brains in and mm -hmm. all together. Mm -hmm. So uh, my brother turned me on to this dog called Norbert, which okay. is a three pound therapy dog that is missing like some of the teeth on this side of the mouth. So its tongue just hangs out uh -huh. and they take this dog around to hospitals so it can high five sick kids. Nick, this is the most adorable fucking dog on the e. planet. Okay. E. No, Nick, shut the fuck up and be amazed. Hold on. I'm going to. E. I'm gonna post this link in okay. the chat yeah, so everybody can see. It's a cute see looking it. thing, but it's not Hawk. <laughs> <laughs> You're crazy! You're insane! This this dog is adorable. You have known me for how many years, and you don't know that I don't care about dogs. Nick, <laughs> this dog is beyond adorable. <laughs> well, let's watch this video real quick. Look at it! He's high fiving people. Aww, there you go. Nice. There that you go. Nice. No one. <laughs> like his stupid fucking face bump. Well, <laughs> there we go. Okay, that's what I see when I see that little dog running around. I'm like, no, there, nothing bad could ever happen to this dog. <laughs> nothing bad I, could ever happen. I don't want to say, um, sorry, Chris, but um, I will just point out that um, dogs' lifespan tends to be measured in um, decades as opposed to millennia. Look, so... <laughs> when this dog dies, it should get that fucking funeral they gave to Superman at Batman versus Superman. Like, where they march it down Washington with, like, the army protecting it. Because <laughs> this dog's a goddamn national treasure. There's times where I feel like America's lost itself. We don't have that sense of greatness anymore. But I'm like, we have Norbert. We have the high-fiving little cute dog. We got it. Like, we're, we're okay. Everything's, let's, let's keep going, guys. If Norbert can do it. So can us. So what we see is our main character, like, just ref just being determined, essentially. You know, time passes. Days path pass. And he's thinking to himself, Yuzuriha will be fine. A good girl like her can't die. There's no way. And I won't die either. I can't let it all in with me as a big fat coward. I've got to tell Yuzuriha how I feel. So I'll survive this through sheer will alone. For weeks, even months, I'll tell her I won't die. And meanwhile, the world is going to shit around everyone because it turns out, uh, yeah, certain things uh, need human maintenance or else they go to shit. And even just beyond that, like if you you know have enough time, then the world just kind of changes. We see floods happening, knocking people over, statues shattering, bridges collapsing, buildings collapsing, falling on people, ground collapsing, ground growing around people, plants growing. And humanity vanished from the Earth several thousand years later. And he wakes up. The stone around his body suddenly cracks open and he just emerges out. And he's alive again. 
in a horribly overground wasteland with a bunch of people who are still statues. Some of them are shattered, uh, but some of them are just still frozen. And he's like, oh my god, look at all this. And uh, noticeably, uh, from the um, experience, I think that's that's where he gets his scar, is the first crack that appears it, like appears over his eye. So he's got like a couple of markings from where the cracks formed over his eyes. Yeah. You're slid like that. But uh, he, um, you know, he prays for a couple of people you know, who have passed. He goes around. We see a bit of a montage of him kind of fashioning vines into sort of underwear. He drinks from a river and he's going around. And he's like, OK, I've got to find that tree. Maybe I can find it. Uh, maybe I can find it if I follow this river. Uh, he sees like a, a, a celebrity uh, Sukasa Shishuo, the strongest primate high schooler, whatever the fuck that means. Uh, and then he comes to the tree, the tree that uh, Yuzuriha had grabbed onto when the event first appeared, and it has grown massive and protected her. Uh, and so he, she, she's still there. Uh, she's still frozen and petrified, but the tree has protected her because you know she couldn't be knocked around, and you know nothing could get her with the tree surrounding her like that. And I love the way that he puts this, which is, well done, tree. <laughs> Good job, tree man. <laughs> Good job, Thanks, tree. Thank you for protecting her for me, tree. He's like, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Just like a branch goes, whatever. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> Get away. <laughs> you protected her for me. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and so, you know, he, he like starts crying in front of her. And she's like, yes, so I managed to survive because you were there. Alone in that darkness and despair for hundreds and thousands of years, the whole time. Listen, Yuzuriha, what I was trying to say on that day, Hanko, what I'm trying to say is I've loved you for this whole time. Like, hmm, a little creepy, but adorable, I guess. Kind of, I don't know. When you hold on to that someone for that long, you know, if it weren't for the apocalyptic context, it would actually be pretty creepy, I think. <laughs> Yeah, it is a little bit strange, but it, you're also kind of just meant to get that sense of, like, this is how pure and innocent his love is, that he'll never stop loving her after all these years. He was able to keep his sanity just because of his love for her mm -hmm. and, and her uh, freakishly large eyeballs. <laughs> she looks, I, I will say, she looks better when she's stone, I think. That's disgusting, Nick. On International Women's Day of all days! <laughs> I mean, in terms of, like, her face yeah, is, like, The expression she's making is, like, is very soft. So, you're talking about how freaky her eyes were. They don't look as big when she's petrified. Oh, I, like I disagree. I, that stone thing, I'm like, good. I, it proves that those eyes are monstrously huge because it's chiseled in stone. It's not, like, fake eyes that got <laughs> glossed over. Those are real eyes because that's all that's left. <laughs> Because you can see her her headphones headband thing is uh, not petrified and stuff. It's weird. Anyway, so he's like, "All right, I'm gonna save you, Zaria. I don't know how, but uh, I'll figure it out." And then he sees that someone has carved into the tree behind her. Go down the river, Big O. <laughs> <laughs> and so he follows the river, and he comes across Senku, the genius guy, who. I love this detail, like he's, you know, fashioned these clothes for himself out of hide, and he's he's got his tools, he's got spears and a tomahawk, and he's fashioned uh, makeshift shoes for himself, and he's just drawn on his clothing, E equals MC squared. <laughs> I am a scientist guy. <laughs> this is my fundamental thing. Everyone must remember. Uh, it's also worth noting that he also has the cracks around his eyes, too. So yeah. I guess that's maybe just a thing. When people wake up, they'll have cracks probably wherever they mm -hmm. woke up first. Where the first cracks emerged, yeah. So uh, he he freaks out that there's another person alive, and he's like, Senko, you're alive! He's like, don't put some clothes on before you hug me! <laughs> uh, and he says, today is October 5th, 5,738. You really overslept. I've been working for over half a year now. And he's just like, how do you know the exact date? And, and this is like, I counted. <laughs> this this would be where you're like, well, this is absurd. But I'm like, one of the things that was so fun about Ice Shield 21 was that they managed to take like the things of football and just take them to the ridiculous. Like, kid can throw a pass in a tenth of a second. Like, no one can do that. 
<laughs> it's like it's like seven characters are able to run 4.2 40-yard dashes, and one character can run a sub 4.2. They're like, that's impossible. But it's just like that's what he creates, and that like is now this, being able to. This see. high schooler can bench press 500 pounds. No, <laughs> that's ridiculous. But now they've just like taken that to a crazy larger degree because it doesn't have to be confined to what seems po- like even remotely possible for football. It's like, yeah, this dude for thousands of years has just been counting the seconds, so he can know exactly when he woke up. Seconds, and then divide that down into millennia. And then he's like, I also have to keep thinking while counting. Make my brain run bro- both processes simultaneously. Since becoming petrified, it has been 3,689 years and 158 days. And he just, like, has also been planning while he has been doing this. <laughs> it's like, what the fuck? And also, he, he makes the observation, Ah, oh, I feel myself fading out every 800,000 seconds. <laughs> it seems to be as regular as my bowel movements used to be. Okay. <laughs> and so he's just, so really you've just been counting? Yes. I, I knew that if I could at some point will myself to awaken, emerging in winter bare naked and without food, would mean an instant game over. Survival depended on making my start in spring. That's why an accurate calendar was absolutely necessary. I had to not only will myself to awaken, but do so when it was convenient. <laughs> Oh, God. So he leads the guy over to where he's built this hut, and he's like, yes, you know, and, but I've been lacking in manpower. I can produce on my own, but uh, I can't, you know, go beyond this point. If I'm to restart civilization, I'll need a certain muscle head to lend me his strength. I've been waiting for you for a long time, Taiju, because I was 10 billion percent sure you were still alive. Uh, all right. And this is just where we get our setup is that, you know, Senku is like, I knew that you would wake up because you're a simple idiot and that you would, you were determined to confess your love to Yuzuriha. And so together, the two of us, until we find a way to awaken everyone else, we must, you know, work together. And Taiju's like, yes, with your thinking and brain power, you, Senku, you'll, we'll leave that to you and then leave the heavy hitting to me. And we will. <laughs> To transition from the Stone Age to modern civilization took humanity two million years, and we're gonna jumpstart that process. We'll save Yuzuriha. We might just be a pair of high school kids, but we're gonna create civilization from scratch. We'll be the Adam of Eve of this stone world. I can't wait. This series is fucking ridiculous already. <laughs> <laughs> humanity has turned to stone. Strong start. This guy got his love confession interrupted, and that gave him the determination to survive until he could awaken from petrification. Okay, got that. We're gonna restart humanity, the two of us, with your amazing willpower and strength and my 10 billion percent smartsness. <laughs> uh, you know, I definitely... I, I'm, I'm definitely intrigued. This is such a like crazy premise and such goofy characters that I feel like there's definitely going to be a very strong chance of this kind of uh, catching the right audience uh, I think also having two big names like this behind the manga is going to definitely help it quite a good deal but uh, I mean this is the premise of me like alright let's see where this goes because right now I'm like you got me hooked in with the initial concept I don't know where we're going from here but I think of the jump starts thus far this is the one that's kind of had me most interested which I kind of thought going into it you know these two names behind it most mm-hmm. particularly in Agaki is such a you know, intelligent writer that I am. Um, I'm willing to go with just about anywhere I'll take us. So I am curious about what kind of series this is going to be. If it's going to be, you know, the challenges of surviving in the wild. If it's going to be some sort of non-traditional battle series. If they're going to have to like end up fending off monsters, essentially like uh, Cradle of Eden was. Um, but uh, definitely an intriguing start to things. I'll mm-hmm. say that. All right. So we're going to move on. Then. God damn it. Skype's still good. Skype's just got that dog on it now. Um, <laughs> Don't fucking bitch about Norbert. You should always be happy. Me. Well, I'm trying to look at, I tried to look at the checklist. Okay. So we're going to hit promise Neverland now. Uh, laying low 
uh, chapter two, which is uh, chapter 29 overall. Very simple uh, title page of uh, three main characters putting their hands together. Um, so it's the uh, the next day that was spoken of, the day that uh, Norman was going to pretend he hid and uh, pretend he ran away and uh, and uh, to hide. And we see him. Oh, wait, hold on. A... Did, did we do uh, Hungry Marie? Oh, fuck, you're right. Um, Hungry Marie. <laughs> okay. Um, wow, this is going to be um, awkward. Okay, so. Uh, I'm not really sure exactly how to recap this one. It's chapter two. Last time, um, our main character, Taiga, burned, it just took on the form of uh, Princess Marie who Anna and her father were trying to resurrect. Uh, things took an unexpected turn. Um, of course, the first thing that Taiga looks at when uh, he sees himself in the mirror is, oh, boobs. I, at first, I was just like, I mean, look, it's kind of like, if, especially since you're seeing it from the first person perspective. But if I saw I was in a different body, like your first thing would be like, what? Like, look down, make sure the mirror is not like fucking with you. So yeah, you would see breasts because of the outfit. But then you hear mush 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 like and you can see he's still doing it because it cuts their expressions and you still hear the mush sound effect as he's like mush 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 and i don't know why that made me fucking laugh so hard <laughs> that they're all just like these horrified expressions and it's just him like mush 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 just mush, like mush, the, mush. the rule of three it eventually eventually doesn't so much it just becomes funny <laughs> so we see uh Taiga's karate club buddies uh, milling around outside. Inside, uh, Anna and her father are trying to figure out what the fuck to do with uh, uh, Taiga, who's taking on the for perform of uh, Mary Therese. And uh, her father goes, let's just say we were close enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's like, good job, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> we're halfway there. Good job so far. And I was like, why are you so happy about this? <laughs> And uh, Tiger's like, um, yeah, what's what, what's going on here? And the father's like, all we gotta do now is get rid of your consciousness. He's like, get rid of beat it down. <laughs> this is a funny series. Um, the karate guys just show up at the front door of the church, and they're like, oh, yeah, we're here to pray. Yeah, we need to know how much XP we need until we level up. He's just, their father has the door, and he's like, die. <laughs> <laughs> Fall out of the ditch. I was like, I don't get where they were coming from, but I love his response of like, get lost and fall in a ditch. <laughs> Go Smash. fuck yourselves, you little assholes. <laughs> Hi there, get lost and fall in a ditch there, boyos. Clam. Oh, yeah. I'm randomly Irish now. <laughs> I'm mostly Irish. Hi, de -toy, de -toy, de -toy. Um, Anna and Tyga hide behind the bench while he, he's trying to get rid of them, and uh, Tyga's like, oh, Saki Mia, she's so pretty. Uh, and apparently he's forgotten that he confessed to her, I think. Um, I think that's the implication here. And or it might just be that he's so caught up in, oh, I am occupying the, the body of a French noble from centuries past. And he doesn't really, <laughs> he's just got his priorities straight and she doesn't. Um, so, um, and is still kind of freaking out over the love confession thing. She ends up emerging from hiding. Uh, the karate guys end up kind of hitting on her which really pisses off Taiga, who stands up in, uh, you know, the ghostly princess's body, and she and she's like, you know, you put your hands on her. You are going to pay for this. And everyone's like, ah, oh, ghost! <laughs> and um, so one of them whips out what he refers to as the Demon Slayer, which is this makeshift spear that he is formed out of, and each part is documented here a talisman, a bamboo pole, and a fruit knife. I don't Tal know why they thought to have that ready, but um, they do. Uh, it sounds exactly like a demon slayer. Yeah. The demon slayer! <laughs> um, Taiga has his super karate skills even in this body, so he kicks the guy's spear in half and kicks him in the head in one motion and uh, starts beating down the karate club people, and it's like, don't you dare do this! And he just really gets angry. Um, and then it's like, oh, wait, I just, uh, oh, Mamoru's here, my friend. Uh, shit. Uh, now he'll know that I am this princess thing, I guess. 
Uh, not so much. Mostly, he just concludes the ghost knows kung fu. Um, all of the bullies run away. I guess they thought they could defeat a ghost as long as she didn't know go kung fu. Yeah, duh. Yeah. It's the only way he could fight. Um, Anna, I guess... A ghost fighting person... type is unprecedented, Nick. <laughs> Anna, I guess, um, sees this display and is like, clearly you are the princess. It's like, because she demonstrated martial arts? I don't really get it. Uh, Taiga's like, it's still me. No, you're the princess. What are you talking about? You're the princess. No, I'm not. What kind of princess uses kung fu? She, like, grabs her hand and is like, you're the princess, right? Yes. I still don't get, I don't get this connection whatsoever. I think, I think she's just affirming, like, she, now that, like, the initial shock is over, she's just saying it over and over again to, like, drive it home. Like, you are the princess. Like, no, I'm not. No, you are the princess. Like, she's she's just... Is he trying to protect Taiga from her father? That and I think just like trying denial? to cement this. Yeah, but probably a bit of denial. Yeah. Um. So the two of them obviously start, you know, treating Taiga just as the princess. Uh, and her father now is is on the other hand uh, side of it. Those like, no, no, no. It's 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 the stupid brat next door that's inside of her, right? I told you, and I was like, no, no, this, which means, so they know something that Taiga doesn't know for some, I guess that, I think that the implication is they've learned something that may, that convinces them that it's the princess instead of Taiga. Yeah, I guess I'm not. It's a bit confusing sorry. in just the way it plays out. So, um, they, you know, start bowing down to the princess and uh, her and his father is like, our superiors will be here soon during their visit. There is nothing you need to tell them. And I was like, that's right. Just do what a princess does. Princess theories. And uh, Dai is like, what's going on? What, what do you mean? Superiors? What is happening here? Oh God. I'm so, I'm so hungry. Oh. And uh, they're like, Oh, we've got some chocolate for the princess. But uh, they kind of turn around. I was like, all right, let's get some, let's get some chocolate for her. And then they turn around and suddenly Tiger standing in front of them. And like, what, what, Wait! Oh no! Oh, our superiors are gonna be here, and now the princess is gone. And suddenly, Tiger says, "What are you doing? Bring me that chocolate you promised me. Your princess is terribly hungry." Don, don, don. I was gonna say, like, if because we talked about last week, like, it's not in crazy unique of the story of a boy who turns into a girl, you know, the rumble one half kind of thing. But I would say it's a unique twist if he turns into the female and it's the male's consciousness, it's the guy's consciousness there. But when he turns back into his regular body, it, that's when the consciousness of the fucking ancient ghost takes over. I'd be like, that'd be a pretty cool twist to put onto it. So it's like this comedic element that whenever he's in the incognito body, the body that should be living a natural life, that's when like the ancient spirits kind of take it over. And maybe his consciousness in the back trying to kind of like maintain some kind of order to it but it's like we had to constantly fucking change him back into fucking Marie Antoinette to actually get Tyga back I thought yeah, that'd be kind the of the prince and the pauper yeah I thought that'd be kind of a funny twist on things at all um, lo and behold it's it's a pretty funny chapter like there's a lot of goofiness to it a lot of silliness uh, I I think the third chapter I think is what's going to decide my feelings on this overall mm. but uh I liked it a lot all right, now we'll do Promised Neverland. I guess. Unless there's, like, another chapter that's, like, hiding on my list somewhere. I don't think so. Mm, no, nah, I think you're good. So, uh, anyway, pick up, let's just pick up where we left it. Norman um, gets rope from uh, Don Gilda, fashioned from bed sheets and stuff. Um, apparently, he's, like, super athletic because he just ties part of it to a tree and then just, like, fucking... Wall runs. <laughs> he, he, he prince of Persia's himself up the wall. Like, like it's explained that like he uses like the uh, the leverage point with the trees in order to kind of. He basically is using that to give himself leverage in order to climb up. But still, this would be incredibly hard to do. The only reason he can do this, I guess, is that the trees are taller than the wall. So he can t tie it to a point high enough that he can still have the support of the rope even when he reaches the top of the wall. 
but still, Jesus Christ. Um, so he looks out over the horizon, then we cut back to Emma and all the kids. Emma's walking around on crutches, and uh, Ray and, and, and everyone's like, where's, where's Norman? Norman's not here. And uh, uh, Isabella is looking down at her pocket watch going, and um, I, I really like the way that Isabella is used in this sequence because we see her face change. And that's all the, the we just see, you know, three panels across these two pages. And we see her freak out and then she get, she just kind of smiles and then she puts the watch away. Um, while Ray and Emma are meanwhile thinking like, ah, he's, yeah, that's right. Norman's escapes. So he's going to hide and you're never going to find him because the tracking device is disabled. You can try and chase him, but he'll just hide in the woods. He'll, he'll hide and we'll hide him until we escape and we won't let him get shipped out. And then all the kids start freaking out and uh, Isabel looks over and then Ray and Don and Gilda and Emma look over like, what? Because Norman suddenly just come out of the woods. He's got this calm look on his face. And everyone's like, what? 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 And Emma's freaking out. He's like, why did you come back? What's happening? And uh, they catch up with him later. They, you know, pull him into Emma's uh, uh, bedroom. Uh, and uh, they're like, what are you doing? You know, Ray's like, w you're going to die. You have to run away and disappear. And everyone's like, I'm not going to run away. And they're like, what are you talking about? And Orin explains, okay, when I investigated on the wall, I saw that on the other side of it, there was a cliff. It's not a height that we can jump down from. Sister wasn't lying. The demons didn't take us lightly. So uh, I ran to the edge of the wall. The wall split in two and is split at like this 60 degree angle. So there's a cliff on one side and then there are sections inside of it. So basically what I think that it's happening here is we're inside of this hexagonal island in the, in the middle of this pit and within that it's divided up into these seven sections uh one in the middle and then six around the edges like this uh the plants are next to each other on each side of the wall there are six lots we're in plant three the lot east of us is probably headquarters so i can deduce that even though we're surrounded by cliffs only that lot had a bridge so if you're gonna escape you have to cross this bridge here and uh, so he's starting to get called away by the other kids. And so he starts to you know put on his formal attire, pull on his jacket and stuff. He's like, okay, um, by the way, Ray, here's your uh, disability device thing. I didn't use it. So you still can, you, you, you can still use it when you do leave. They're like, so both of them are just like, why are you doing this? Where, what is going on here? Are you saying that you were just playing and coming back from the beginning? And, uh, and Ray's like, I get it. So you didn't just return to tell us about the cliff. You could have reported that to us while you were in hiding. So you were never planning on leaving. Why why is that? You know, you said that you were gonna survive together with us, but you're already planning this. And I was like, Yep, I lied. And uh he explains, I can't risk this, I can't let anyone die. If I run away, the plan might be ruined. It'll be hard to escape. So even if it's just by little, that's a problem for me. I can't lose this no matter what. And uh, I've already made my decision. It's too late, so it's pointless to argue. I did what I can, and I'm leaving the rest to you. Make sure the escape is successful. And then he gives them both a hug while they're just kind of too shocked to say anything. And uh, he says, thanks for everything. Because of you two, I had a good life. I had fun. I was happy. I was fortunate. And Bran and I are freaking out, and I was begging him, come on, it's not too late. You can still run and hide. And Norman says, I've already made my decision. Goodbye. But wait, <laughs> my baby memories might be able to solve something here. <laughs> oh, damn it. <laughs> let me, let me think of the two. Let me, let me take one. Let me think of one of the two thousand ways I'm broken in order to solve this problem. <laughs> Hold on, wait. Let me, let me address all my baby memories to see if something can help us here. No, but I'm remembering how I appreciated music so much earlier than the rest of you. <laughs> I remember when I realized that we should probably not be drinking whole milk because that's just extra fat that we don't need <laughs> and we're proprietary in an industry that isn't needed we live on a farm where children are raised for food okay but you're, you're, you're being selfish and you're he, not being like, he's like just... think about it this way though if they had almond children then that way we wouldn't <laughs> none of us would have to be eaten so maybe if you'd stop perpetuating this system of Ray, violence he already <laughs> left <laughs> hold on Norman Norman Norman, if you just stop eating all, stop ordering cheeseburgers all the time. <laughs> he just chases him down to fucking. 
<laughs> when you get adopted by your family, which is like going to E2, make sure that you only eat whole weight. <laughs> you should make sure that you buy secondhand because buying from a store is really bad for what we're trying to do, and you're not really helping anybody. <laughs> like he just he takes him down just to hipster shame him. <laughs> oh god. All right. Uh, as he's making his way out to meet with Isabella, Norman is thinking to himself, they're a little too naive. Ray believed that I keep my promise, and Emma thought Ray's no problem would solve everything. She hasn't realized yet that he's only talking about the oldest five. The world's not so easy that we can have it all. I don't want those two to die, and I don't want Emma to leave anyone behind. Leaving no one behind, it might be an idealist thought, an empty dream. Most people might give up on it, saying it's impossible. But for that reason, I want to overturn that assumption. I don't want to give up. That's why I choose death. And uh, he walks off with Isabel as the chapter ends. So. The, it took, I read through this and I was like, this is weird. And then I was like, he found that pen and then he made this decision. Hmm. So. Norman knows something that he's still not telling anybody. Yes. Uh, a lot of people, I think, are, are getting sad about this because they're like, oh, you know, Norman's going to die and things like that. I, I, no. This is, this is not Norman's <laughs> death. I, I, I think you have to have enough faith in the mangaka here uh, to know that this isn't his send-off, you know. If Norman's getting killed, he's going to get at least the same level of dramatic send-off that Crone got when she was killed. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if this means that the, the wheels are in place for Norman's eventual demise. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's possible. But him being done here is not the case. We're going to definitely get more Norman. I just don't know if we know necessarily how the so. The author yet. specifically says in the comments at the, end of the, at the end of Jump, Norman will be in next week's chapter. Don't miss it. So, so. I, I think we will see more of Norman. I just don't know to what extent yet but uh I, I, this was a really interesting chapter as we kind of continue to just uh make it so you can't really know what to expect with the promised neverland every week just seems to change things up again mm -hmm. and again it's uh it's interesting though and i, I like the way that this turned where thing is like okay yeah we're all together we're gonna make it through this together and norman just kind of pulls a fast one on his friends so hmm but uh, yeah, I'm mean, interested to see where this goes. Like, we could very well get the death, get the, death, the get the death of Norman soon. Who knows? Yeah, it's very possible, but it's certainly not going to be this chapter. All right, let's move on to Black Clover, page one hundred, the Red Thread of Fate. Uh, okay, so um, the Red Thread of Fate um, emerged from Vanessa at the end of the last chapter, taking the form of a kitty cat uh, that came out of, a, out, of her, uh, out of her head. And uh, this chapter ends with Vanessa being like, why is there a cat? I didn't visualize a cat. And cat immediately flops over and is like, mm -hmm. I'm a kitty. I, I like I doing my, cat things. I, I get on my back sometimes. See, if this was my cat, it would immediately jump down and found like uh, Vanessa's most precious cable that she needs and just immediately chew right through it. Uh, and then poop on her bed. So I'm glad that her cat's well, more well behaved. So, um, before we, because it's, I think it's going to be pretty easy to go through this chapter because, um, of, of what happens. Um, I will say before we actually get into the meat of it, I finally saw Dr. Strange last week. Okay. Um, what timing? <laughs> <laughs> Damamu, I've come to bargain. Dormammu, I've come to bargain. <laughs> yeah, he's like getting tired. Dormammu, bargain, you, you get it. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna keep on happening, but you'll suffer forever. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, what happens is uh, the Red Thread of Fate jumps onto Asta as the Witch Queen is commanding Asta to cut down Noel, and we see Noel's head go fucking flying off. So, uh, yeah, that cleaver got a lot sharper while he was possessed, I guess. And, uh, but, um, so, Witch Queen's like, huh, alright, that didn't do anything. I guess it was incomplete. 
I am perfection. I will ensure that it is fostered properly under my supervision. And then we cut back and see that Asta is now standing in front of him, Noel. He's like, what? I just had him cut down the royal girl. All right. Cut, down, cut her <laughs> down again. And Asta rushes forward, and instead his cleaver slashes the ground harmlessly in front of, in front of Noel. And the witch king's like, wait, actually, he cuts ah. he cuts the uh, thing beneath her. He cuts like the oh, he actually oh, so she the, falls the, over the crucifix, so she, like, she hits the yeah. ground. He falls to the ground, so Asta stands over her, and uh, and uh, Venice is like, no, stop! And the cat bounds into Asta again. He stabs Noel through the chest, and he goes cuts back. Asta standing over Noel. Venice is like, stop! And Asta's hand grabs the cleaver and he stops it. And the witch king's like. What? What? Wait a minute. What? What? Uh, okay, go after that one. He goes and cuts down Finral. The cat's jumped into him. He misses Finral instead. And meanwhile, the cat this whole time is going, <laughs> And so the witch king's like, all right, kill the cat. He cuts through the cat. He doesn't do anything. He touches Asta again. Nothing happens. Uh, the puppet's blood uh, that is controlling him starts to come undone. And the witch queen's like, what's happening? No. Oh my god, this is the power to control destiny. This magic changes the destinies of the people the cat touches to the cat's advantage. Vanessa herself probably doesn't see the fates where her companions are killed. She's only seeing the attacks continue against all as to miss. This cat is both harmless and unavoidable. Hmm. Vanessa, you have awakened. Then I shall control you. She takes over Vanessa with puppet's blood. And now your magic is mine. Now, Destiny, align yourself with me! And the cat jumps into, into the Witch Queen. It disperses immediately. <laughs> and Vanessa's like, So this is the power to control Destiny you were talking about. I don't know much about this power yet, but there's one thing I do know. This magic only takes the side of those I have a family bond with. You and I have no bonds. Oh, shit! Snip, snip, snap. Um, that was all right. Yeah, I, I I like the way it's executed here. I think that's actually pretty cool. Like we see the horrifying, violent conclusions mm -hmm. that the the queen's trying to attempt, and then just see it repeat back. We're re almost not not even rewind. We're just back to that moment again where she's like, I love her whole fucking ruined sin and having underestimated the witch queen. She's like, ah, oh, that we killed these guys all right well ruin sin i mean underestimate like wait didn't i say this already <laughs> what's happening this is, this is deja vu all right do it again it's actually a really satisfying way of kind of seeing the villain get their comeuppance when it's like they think they've succeeded all right i'll just control you then <laughs> well yeah. that didn't work <laughs> and seeing everything like kind of fall apart around them uh i almost kind of wish we'd had more time to really know the witch queen to have this feel a little bit more satisfying because it's it's a little abrupt and we haven't gotten to know her that much but it's still really effective as a like a takedown for for eliminating the the villain and i like that it did show that yeah it wasn't like fucking asta's never give up you know hustle loyalty respect that was gonna get them out of this if that cat didn't fucking get involved he was about to chop that bitch's head right off so they were all gonna be mega dead yeah, it, it's nice to see, like, oh, no, Vanessa really did come in to save the day here. Now, this is a pretty crazy powerful power, uh, so I, you know, I'm hoping some level of balance has to come in. But uh, it, this is a fun, unique kind of execution for this concept, and I, I think this was a really fun way of kind of having Chapter 100. It's nice to have the hero be someone that's not Asta, and it's, it's you know, it's satisfying all the way around, I feel. I feel a lot about, a lot like um, I felt after the last chapter, which was, eh, it's fine in the bottle. I just kind of wish that we had gotten this build up for Vanessa more mm -hmm. over the course of this arc. Yeah, but I yeah, agree. Quite good. All right, we're going to wrap things up then with One Piece. Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Where, where the hell are you? All right. Chapter 57. Rook. Uh... It's a bit more of a cut around thing, but uh, people finally start to get like on the same page in this one. So we actually get a conversation going on between all the all the straw hats that are on the island. As uh, basically, what happens is uh, you know Luffy and Sanji, of course, had their conversation last week. They're kind of resolved that they're going to try and help. Uh, that Sanji wants to help his family, even though he doesn't really like them. Um, and 
with inside of mirror world uh chopper tries to reach out to uh luffy and sanji through a shard of uh the mirror that was uh on top of King Bomb, the monster tree that they had their confrontation at, and they're bound they right by it. So they managed to reach uh, Luffy and Sanji, and they're essentially like talking to them almost as if it's over a phone uh, that way. Um, so the you know, Chopper's recaps like, oh, yeah, everyone's here. We rescued everyone. Uh, Brooke managed to copy the Poneglyph, and Luffy's like, oh, I knew you guys could do it. And a little bit of a running gag happens in this chapter where Chopper and Carrot and Brooke all re react uh, to the stuff that he says to them. Um, and uh, so, you know, Chopper does, all, oh, you can't, yeah, you, don't, don't try and flatter me, you jerk. And Carrot copies him because she looks up to him. And then Brooke does his own take on it, which is, you silly Billy. Oh, you silly Billy. Silly Billy. <laughs> Silly Billy is fucking great. Um, and so Paige is like, okay, so everything's settled here. And uh, Luffy says, well, Sanji's not coming back yet. We're going to smash up Big Mom's tea party in the wedding. We'll save Sanji's family. And then Sanji will come back with us. And uh, everyone's kind of like, whoa. And, and Sanji says, oh, come on, Luffy. Like, seriously, like, she's an emperor of the sea. I don't want my selfishness to expose them. I mean, to expose Nami to danger. I don't care about anyone else. Yeah. Uh, and they hear through the shard, Yee! and uh, Chopper and the other two are bawling. And he, he's like, I heard you had a huge fight with Luffy. I was so worried, dummy. And Carrot's like, I'm so glad, dummy. And Brooke's like, dum dum, <laughs> silly Billy. <laughs> but uh, the Nami then. Uh, chimes in by saying, Sanji, after the way that you cast me into the depths of terror, I will never forgive you. <laughs> but I can forget that for a moment because, yeah, we're, we're, we're going to do this and uh, we're not leaving without you on board, Sanji. So not all is forgiven, but we're still a crew, so we're going to help you out so that you can come back with us. And uh, it's a it's a nice moment. One of the hey, we made we did a bonus pod um, on um, the One Piece film. Uh, God, what was it? Baron Nomatsu Island, or Matsuri Island, something right. like the secret. Baron Island. Matsuri and the Secret Island, or something like that. Mm -hmm. And Baron Matsuri, that was it. And in that, one of the main criticisms we had was, man, the bonds between the Straw Hats aren't on their best form today. <laughs> They're very easily shattered for some reason. <laughs> So seeing this, it was nice to have that one of those big, the straw hats, you know, will do anything for each other moments. Uh -huh. um, a lot of stuff gets recapped and we get a good amount of talking from Jimbe uh, at this point, because uh, Jimbe is like, OK, I want to you know, point out here that you know, even though we're not going to be actually trying to directly take on and beat Big Mom at this point, you know, she looks forward to her tea parties like little else in this world. If we prevent this from happening, we will be igniting the wrath of one of the four emperors. And on top of that, well, I'm sure you've seen a number of Big Mom's ministers. They are merely the tip of the iceberg of her forces. There will be figures attending her tea party who are even more fearsome. Not to mention her invited guests, the tyrants of the underworld. Meanwhile, we've got ten people helping us. And behind him, Brule and the steam locomotive guy are like, What are you talking about? Don't count us. There's eight of you. <laughs> They're rounding up. <laughs> I just love that. Jimmy's like, we have 10 people here for us. Is it like assuming that they're going to turn on, on Brulee's mother? <laughs> like, knowing that Brulee's still like tied up in a sack. <laughs> 10 of us here to we help have, us. We only have 10 strong warriors. <laughs> like, we're not included. Eight <laughs> no, strong warriors. Who does in this? <laughs> I forgot how I loved, like, Jim Bay's deadpan fucking logic. Weird, sent the weird humor used in his attitude. Yeah. Um, and then he dedicates a good amount of time to talking about Capone Gang Beige, uh, the guy who actually took Sanji away. Uh, yeah, he's you know one of the one of the worst generation, uh, and uh, he comes from one of the five families of the West. One of those five bosses is Beige. He received the gang epithet when he was young and earned a reputation as a savage and brutal muscle man. 
I've heard he cuts the heads off animals and enjoys watching them writhe in the throes of death. Well, shit. <laughs> but uh, he also, you know, he, he took out the leaders of these organizations, uh, took them on alone, even as the leader of a mob family. He only ever took down his rival leaders, except that he never showed interest in their position or territory. He merely took their valuables and left. And, uh, yeah, basically really building up how incredibly powerful uh, Beige is in this whole thing. Uh, and uh, then... Of course, you know, a whole bunch of people came after him. You know, he's the constant target of, of vengeance. But even that is a game to Beige. He sits up behind his iron fortress, fights them off, and mocks his enemy's futility. Jimmy is just talking about this guy. I'm like, wow, what an asshole. <laughs> um, but yeah, so he ended up take, working, of course, under Big Mom, which we know about that. Uh, and he has been granted the title of Rook before the upcoming tea party, and he's been placed in charge of security for the entire event. And if there are guards, there is no way, no one is going to stop them from getting what they want, though, because they're the guards of this position. And they're like, wait, what are you talking about? And Jimbe says, well, Big Mom plans to slaughter the Vinsmokes during the ceremony, and thus seize all of German's assets for himself. But meanwhile, behind her back, it is Beige who plans to take Big Mom's head. Um... And what we get from this is we learn at the end of the chapter, basically, that Beige actually is on the side of the Vinsmokes. According to him specifically, we share a common interest in opposing Big Mom. So the rational course of action. Uh, let me get to that. Where, where, is he, where is he supposed to say this? Because he actually makes a note of, uh, there it is. I told you, Germa's my hero's man. So, so um, now we basically know what the hell happened uh, with Bobbin in the last chapter uh -huh. um, was it turns out that there was this entire other faction that we didn't know about until just now going on within everything. I, um, I, it's very sudden development, honestly. It is very sudden. There's one thing that I fucking love because the big thing now is like, hey, you know, you're trying to saying to, to get over our big mom. It's going to be very difficult. Why not help? But why not team up with this guy who's been planning this relentlessly for this day to help get over on it. So it's like, all right, you're going to have a meeting with B uh, Beige. So they show you the shot of it, and you see, like, uh, Vigo or whatever his name in the back. And then it's to the right is Caesar Clown, like, trying to look cool. And, like, like I'm just another member of your group. And you're like, wait, that's Caesar Clown? I'm, I'm pretty certain that's Caesar Clown, because they're the ones who arrested Caesar Clown. And I like... <laughs> I like they're all spiked up, and he's like, you know. "That's his face for sure." And I like to think he's like, "I'm just a gangster now." <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm a gangster, but y'all knew that. <laughs> y'all knew how cold I was, West Saida. <laughs> I had no idea that was supposed to be Cedar Clown. I just completely overlooked it. Ah, <laughs> uh, Christ. I, I'm pretty stoked for this development because this, uh, I, I like the idea that all of the members of the worst generation, the supernovas, are supposed to be big deals. And, mm -hmm. it, 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 you know, it didn't necessarily feel that way for a while. Especially with, like, three of them in a row getting their asses kicked. Yeah, so the notion here is, like, yeah, they might seem at first like they're not going to be the biggest deals, but... And maybe that isn't Caesar Clown. I don't know, guys. It looks fucking exactly like him, so that's what I'm holding on to the idea that that's Caesar Clown. Maybe it's just someone that looks exactly like him. I don't know. Yeah. But I, I just like this idea that Capone is like, no, I'm a fucking, I'm a big player. I'm planning to get one over on one of the biggest players in the world. And hey, all those characters who were introduced there are huge and significant characters. Like, we're not going to be just these footnotes in the story of everyone else. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, that's really cool so uh this is a pretty cool chapter to not only be like hey beige is a big deal but also to give him a lot more detail and the you know color of the world a lot more too as well like it's like oh hey you know the west blue was known for being kind of run by these five mafia families and be beige was one of them and he's you know he's succeeded by infiltrating different groups and mm -hmm. taking out their leaders it's like okay this is pretty cool there's there's also little bits in the conversation that happen, you know, like the reason that they know about this whole thing is that Peckham's uh, learned about it, but he's too loyal and honorable to have accepted the proposal. 
So Beige tried to kill him, uh, as we saw earlier on, and uh, Jimbe ended up rescuing him and learning about it that way. Uh, there's the bit where, you know, like Jimbe just points out, like he lays things out very logically while he's pitching this. Where he's like, you know, I understand you want to help out your friend, but the tea party begins in five hours. So that only leaves a few hours to craft an entire plan among the 10 of us. And again, they're like, eight, eight of you. <laughs> um, and then, you know, Luffy is, is like, you know, this sounds like a good idea. And Chopper and Nami are freaking out. I was like, just so you know, like four of the six of us are against this, which makes me wonder who the person who agreed with Jimbe was among the six of them. Because we see Chopper and Nami freaking out about this. And it's like, huh, I wonder who the last person to agree with uh, Jimbe actually was among them. Uh, I mean, the only other people are what? Brooke? Uh... It's uh, Brooke, Jimbe, Carrot, and Pedro, and Nami and Chopper. So Jimbe obviously, you know, proposed this idea. So it's either it's probably I, either Brooke, I, I imagine, or Pedro. I imagine Pedro. That seems like his the most like level-headed, uh, among logical them. kind of person. Yeah. yeah. But I like how there's this. How, you know, Chopper's like, just so you know, Luffy, it's four against, four to two against them. And Jimbe says, "Well, I've got a meeting arranged. If you want to agree to it." And Luffy's like, "Yeah, let's do it <laughs> right now." <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's um. Things are getting kind of weird uh, with all this. A, a very sudden turn of events um, where it's, you got to wonder, it's like, okay, well, what the hell is going to happen in this whole thing? It's no longer just like, okay, we've got to save the Vince Smokes from being completely surrounded. Now it looks like there's going to be a big battle breaking out, which I guess could leave the Straw Hats with their avenue for escape. Nick, a wonderful opportunity has just presented itself. Hmm? You get to do your awesome Marlon Brando impersonation now. Oh, no. <laughs> we share a common interest in opposing Big Mom. The rational course of action is not to make extra enemies. Everything else depends on what Straw Hat says. If he tries any funny stuff, we'll just snuff him out here. Then you need a wacky laugh. No, la, 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 la. There you go. Boom. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> Boom. Print it. Oh, God. All right. So that's going to do it for the recap portion. We can mark recap. Let's wrap things up because we don't have a whole lot of time left um, to uh, name our favorites this week. Uh, favorite chapters and MVPs. Why don't you start things off while I open up the spreadsheet? Oh, man. Can I start with favorite character? Because that's easier. Sure, sure. Uh, my character MVP is going to be uh, uh, Capone. Uh, I just mentioned for those reasons. It's like a great chapter to really build this idea that he's going to be a huge and significant character going forward. Uh, at least more notable than we first kind of considered. So uh, I'm going to give it to him for that. Hmm. Uh, I'm a little bit torn on this one because there were, I mean... There's some good, enjoyable chapters this week. Um, I think that I am going to end up going... Oh... God. Because so, there's a couple that we want to do. Um, I think I'm going to actually go with Dojima from Food Wars. Okay. Uh, I like the uh, little uh, flashback that he got in this. No, oh, I completely really understand that. And... Uh, God, that's Chap favorite chapter, chapter of the week's really tough. I, I think there were a lot. I don't think. I mean, there was like other than other than the usual ones that we tend to rag on anyway. There was like not a bad chapter this week. So I think I'm going to go with uh, Doctor Stone just for being like a very unique and interesting chapter. Um, uh, the other, you know, Promise Neverland, One Piece, Black Clover, they were all decent this week. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think I'm just going to give it to Doctor Stone for just. You know how unique of an entry that seemed to be. Mm -hmm. I'm really torn on this one because there are because I don't think you could really go wrong uh, in choices this week. But I'm going to go with One Piece uh, because it was uh, an amusing chapter and it was you know, it, it built up Capone really well. A just like an overall really complete thing that was really mostly dialogue anyway. Um, yeah, funny moments from Jinbei, cool moments from Jinbei. Um, nice interaction between the straw hats that were there. 
uh, a big twist that really changes the way that the that it seems like this whole arc is going to go down. Just a, a, a whole ton of different elements that I really liked about it. No, I understand that completely. And uh, who won the who won the poll? Uh, I don't have my thing open, unfortunately. Oh, MVP Norbert should be uh, considering the uh, option. Uh, one piece by a hair. All right, so. there we go. So that is uh, going to do it then. We're going to wrap things up here. So thank you, everyone, for listening to Week Manga Recap. We record the show normally at 7 p.m. on Wednesdays on hitbox.tv slash as well as twitch.tv slash Sometimes plans change, however, and to stay updated, you can follow us on Twitter. He's at RolloT. I'm at Roller of Time. And the official Week Manga Recap's Twitter account, which Chris mentioned, mentioned earlier, is at WMR Podcast. That's where basically all of our official business goes. Uh, you can make sure to check out past episodes on weeklymagrecap.podbean.com. Subscribe to us on iTunes. Subscribe to us on YouTube. And uh, be sure to leave a comment or rating on those latter two, particularly iTunes, because that will improve our chances of beating our eternal rivals, the woodworkers. Someone's got to do it. One day, someone's going to step up. <laughs> or, uh, or not. And uh, we just uh, we, we crumble. I like to think we're like the uh, WWE. If you have w- just- All right, fine. I won't make my WWE Survivor Series reference. Nope. You can check out. <laughs> you can email stuff to us, weeklymagarecap at yahoo.com. Use that to suggest manga for us to read in the future. Ask us questions for our Q&A episodes, the next of which we should be recording tomorrow. And uh, also just, you know, to provide general feedback on if you like something, if you want us to continue doing one particular thing over another. That kind of thing. Uh, special thanks go out to our Patreon supporters. You can uh, do all sorts of stuff to help us out, but uh, even if it's just a little bit, um, even just like sharing the link, even if it's like a dollar, we appreciate every little bit. Uh, and uh, your support allows us to do bonus content for you guys to enjoy, such as that Q&A episode, uh, such as stuff like Weekly Manga Recap Lewis for the bonus episodes and uh, streaming commentary as well. Yes. So uh, oh, special thanks, by the way, to Alex Downs, who is our newest patron. It is greatly appreciated. Thank you very much, Alex. Boosh. Fist bump. And of course, special thanks go out to Infamous Planet and uh, Steve Man. Steve Man has his own Patreon, which you can check out, patreon.com slash Steve Man. Uh, and he has a number of different other places where he keeps his artwork as well. A lot of it has boobs, uh, which I'm sure you can't tell by looking at the picture they drew for us for this week at all. There you go. I'm going to ask you to draw a Norbert title card. <laughs> It'd just be like, just be a dog's head with a tongue sticking out on on top of a pair of boobs. <laughs> High-fiving a pair of tits that says, w- yeah. I love WMR. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, we are still going to be covering stuff that we're considering adding to the recap. We are definitely going to be adding, uh, in addition to the fact that we have added Astro, which is not always regularly updated we are going to be doing seven deadly sins as well and this time we're going to be checking out another biggie uh which is blue exorcist it's one that we got some uh quite a few people asking us to do um it's uh, a monthly so uh, i'm not sure exactly how long this is one's going to take us because it's not as many chapters but they're long chapters but uh yeah we'll be checking it out you're real fuck you know that <laughs> too bad Fair enough. Goodbye, everybody. Friendship is uh, being tested right now. <laughs>